Hello, testing. Yes, it's common that six-year-olds are more effective learners than 15-year-olds, even when they put in less explicit work. Well, I do know, and the state of the debate, in my opinion, is there's no one on the other side who will debate it and knows what they're talking about. Why doesn't he just read the literature on this? Like Horowitz's Shadow Party book and the Discover the Networks pages, which I've already recommended. This is a very like start at the beginning question when there's a lot of material available.
Hugh Laurie is a good example. Um, he put a lot of work into speaking American English for the House TV show. Including, for example, speaking in American between scenes, not just while the camera was rolling. And talking to the other cast members that way at all times. So that they would see him that way, and it would seem natural to them. And that kind of thing makes a difference, but it's... It took a major effort and an ongoing policy. The world is full of awful things. There's good things too, but there's plenty of awful ones. That's not, it shouldn't be so surprising. This is going to be a shorter stream, by the way. Oh yeah, I need to pop out the chat.
DOI builds on fabric in certain ways. It's not like a necessary prerequisite, but it makes some things easier. I don't know if he's like watching the stream or not. There's a new comment. Wait. Maybe there's not, and I misremember the number. Explicit and conscious, yes. Okay, sure. Inexplicit and conscious. Yes. But you can have a picture in your head, you can have like a hunch that you don't really know how to put into words. You can have a feeling like that you're happy that you don't know how to put into words. I mean, you can say I'm happy, but that doesn't fully capture it. So there's part of the content is inexplicit, even if you can put it into some sort of words like I'm happy. Or similar, if you can say I have a hunch, that's not putting all of what you're thinking into words, it's only putting it partially into words. Inexplicit and subconscious, yes. Okay, explicit and subconscious. Yes, I think your subconscious can process English words. I don't know how common that is, but it's certainly possible. Like, there's nothing that would make it impossible. What the hell? I didn't hit a button. Oh, it was my um, it was my mail hotkey, which activated with like a ten second delay, and it changed Windows and Discord. Well, I was thinking about whether you could um, like work on them or make progress on them, but they could certainly just be not currently in your consciousness and still be an explicit idea. That's, that's easy. Later.
There's good evolution info elsewhere. I would start with what David says about evolution in both of his books, but if you want more details after that, then, for example, The Selfish Gene is a good book, and it's relevant to memes, uh, just because understanding evolution better helps with meme stuff. All right, what am I going to do? All right, let's look at these tabs. Oh, I finished this video. Let's see if there's any comments before I close the tab. No comments. So All right. Oh, yeah, I had stuff to say about this. So I watched this video and the Ben Shapiro one previously. Like two days ago, maybe? There's a phenomenon of destroy videos on YouTube. It seems that we... Uh, I can't hear. I think my iPhone might have stolen my beats. Now can I hear? Love to watch oh, there we go. have meltdowns when they're verbally bested. Now, we normally consider the person who did the destroying to be the winner of those interactions, but there is a different take, which I want to examine today in this video. And we're going to be using Jordan Peterson in his recent conversations with Sam Harris. In this video, there were two really bad arguments. that The guy making a video and analyzing argument quality and stuff, like just totally didn't notice the problem. That is what I remember noticing. And I think one of them was very near the beginning. So I was just gonna rewatch the beginning. I should see it. It's something Peterson says, so. As an example, now here is the problem in his own words. You're going to have contentious discussions about how to move forward. And it's very frequently the case that your words will be, that you'll be straw man. Your words will be taken out of context. The other person and you too will try to win instead of trying to solve the problem. But winning an argument and even destroying the other person isn't the same as solving the problem. Worse, winning an argument can damage the relationship if it isn't done with tact. So in this video, we're going to look at five tips from Dr. Peterson on how you can win arguments without either person having to get destroyed. Now, to be clear, there are times when Jordan is going to be more aggressive or defensive, and maybe I will do another video on those type of point scoring debates if that is something that you're interested in. But for now, the first tip that you need to know is that you should begin most disagreements by delineating not where you differ, but where you agree, which is where Jordan started in his discussion with Sam Harris in Vancouver. I thought what I might do is just lay out some places that I think Sam and I agree. And because there's lots of places we agree. And in this next clip, you're going to see concretely how calling out areas of agreement can make someone more. Oh, yeah, that was it. What? In his discussion with Sam Harris in Vancouver. I thought what I might do is just lay out some places that I think Sam and I agree. Okay, so, so far we're at right here. That's fine. And then he says because. And it's the because that's incoherent. He says he's going to lay out places Sam and him agree. And then he says because. And because there's lots of places we agree. And in this next clip. So he says because there are lots of places they agree. That is not a reason. Just because there are lots of places that you agree does not mean you should lay out what they are. There are lots of something, therefore I'll go into it. That's fucking nonsense. It's not intelligent. It's not reasonable. Um, he's just throwing big words out there, and he's trying to sound like he's saying something, but he's a fraud. Like, 
that particular statement, I mean, if it was just a one-off error, it wouldn't make him a fraud, but he does that kind of thing regularly. And if he was actually thinking about what he meant, he wouldn't have said that. That is not a reason. Why would you say that? Like, how could you think that was a reason? He's more focused on, like, charisma and saying things to impress an audience and whatever than actually thinking, all right, what ideas make sense? How do I say things that make sense? What am I trying to say? Et cetera, et cetera. But just, yeah, having a lot of areas of agreement is not a reason to talk about them. And he said, he just said because and then gave a non-reason. So I think that's really bad. Yes, Alan, I agree with Alan's point. There are many um, areas of agreement between Peterson and Harris, which are not worth pointing out, which are not relevant, like 1 plus 1 equals 2. You could go on and on with infinitely many things they agree about, which are totally boring and irrelevant. And if you're just looking at relevant agreements, you might go into that if there's like two things you agree about that you think are relevant. Like it doesn't have to be a large number. The reason to go into points of agreement is it gives you, there are several reasons. One is to double check them. He might say, no, actually, I disagree with that. Um, two is to try to show you understand what the other guy is saying and what he thinks. Uh, three is to have some common ground. So you're like friendly, you can establish rapport. Um, another is having points of agreement gives you things you can build on or you can just assume it as a premise without having to argue it. So it's like a, a set of intellectual tools or ideas or whatever that you can use in this discussion because both of you accept it. So there's things you don't have to debate because you can't debate and question and consider and doubt everything at once. You have to accept some things to discuss other ones. And this gives you stuff that you can refer to that won't be controversial. Because there's a lot of times you want to make a point, and there's like 10 different ways that you know of to make the point. And you would prefer one that doesn't lead to a sub-discussion argument. You'd prefer a way where you just make the point and the other person says, I agree, instead of saying, oh no, I disagree. There, it's often that there is a way to make the point that the person would agree with. Like, he actually does agree with your point. It's just that some of the arguments for it, for the point he would disagree with, and some he would agree with. So if you can use the ones he agrees with, you can avoid extra controversies and focus more of your attention on the things you're trying to debate instead of just uh, letting like extra debate points come up that are unnecessary. So there, there are reasons to talk about it. Peterson just doesn't explain any of them and says something dumb. So there was a there's another dumb thing he said somewhere in this video that's like 10 minutes, so I'm not sure if I actually want to watch more. I'll watch a little in, at higher speed and see how it goes. But you're going to see concretely how calling out areas of agreement can make someone more open to alternate viewpoints. The context of the student is asking a question and pointing out what he perceives to be a potential hold in Jordan Peterson's argument against hate speech laws. Watch how Jordan responds and notice how the student begins to nod. The idea of being engaged in retaliatory and anti-retaliatory discourse against it because they get the potential that it doesn't lead to violence. They just get so much that it might irrational or rationally. It happens all the time. In fact, it's the standard. It's the standard situation. You know, if you look across the world, essentially Peterson spends the next two minutes agreeing and expanding on the student's point. Now, the student nods through much of this because Peterson is expanding on the issue that the student himself raised. The more that Jordan elaborates on the student's point, the more that he feels heard and understood. What's interesting is that when Jordan then lays out perspective, this no, no, this is not truth seeking. This is how to get people to nod along with you, like. This is a type of manipulation. You're dealing with a person who, if you don't manipulate him, he will be hostile to new ideas, and if you do manipulate him, he'll be friendly to them. Not all new ideas, but certain ones. And, and so it's awkward, because if you actually just present your ideas in a neutral, objective way, the person is like biased against you, and you have to like fight the bias. And so there's an incentive uh, you you get sort of unfairly treated if you aren't manipulative, but it's still manipulation. Because the, the person is just not a very good thinker and not a very reasonable person. The student hadn't considered before, not even continues. And so the consequences of the regulation become in, in, incalculably worse as a problem than the problem that they were designed to deal with. To think otherwise is to think in a sort of utopian manner. Now, if Jordan had just left into what the student had missed, that nodding probably would not have been there. And more importantly, the student would not have been as open to a new idea. But in laying out the points of agreement and expanding on the point of the person that you're speaking with, you actually create more likelihood that they're going to open up other perspectives. And when you're trying to establish your points of commonality or any differences, you don't. Yeah, so this is all how to manipulate people without calling it manipulation. 
can't actually know for certain if you understand what the other person thinks. So is best fisky in terms like these. Okay, so so then it also seems like we agree that the, the core element of tribal alliance, which would have its roots in the chimpanzee. Well, you can't see that picture. Basically, it's the dominant capitalist. It's crystal clear you can't just say so you're saying and then feel a strong in argument. We saw how that turned out in the other video we did in Jordan Peterson. You have to clarify the other person's point in a way that they would agree with. Now, when this is done in good faith, there is a profound difference between using the phrase it seems like and simply saying what you're doing. It seems like invites correction, and it comes from a desire to engage in a dialogue rather than telling the other person what logical leaps they're making. I also mentioned this phrase it seems like in our last video on tells that you are dealing with an arrogant or person who's lacking in confidence, but you want to know more of those, go ahead, click below, check that video out. But you will eventually have to come to contentious points of disagreement in your conversation, it's inevitable. And there's a number of ways to make your stance clear without the other person feeling attacked. You can begin, for instance, by establishing your good intentions like this. What's the, I'm not trying to trap you here. Oh yeah, this, this is a thing I didn't like. This might be the second thing. There might not be anything else. It's just, I'm not trying to trap you here. He says this repeatedly, and it just completely comes off to me, like, saying, no offense, but you're ugly. Um, just explicitly denying he's trying to trap Sam is not an argument that he's not trying to trap Sam, and it's not an argument that regardless of his intentions, whether the, the things he's saying, the arguments, will or will not trap Sam. So I thought it was just this total bald assertion, and that the, the guy making the video was really impressed with it. And like, if I was on the other side, if someone said, I'm not trying to trap you here, I would be calling them out, well, that, or maybe ignoring it and trying to focus on something that matters, but if I was going to deal with it at all, I'd be calling them out. Like, I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't think that it means that they're honest and not trying to trap me. I wouldn't take it at face value. People bring up things like whether or not they're trapping you or whether or not what they say is offensive, because there's an actual issue there that they might be trapping you or offending you. I have not read The Meme Machine. I've read... That's the Blackmore one, right? Or is that something else? Right, that's the Blackmore one. I've read uh, pieces of it or like quotes or something, or if not from that, from something by Blackmore, like I've looked into a bit, and I thought that she was totally clueless, and so I did not read her book. I think maybe someone else read it, like David or Alan. Seriously, not. Um, so, so we're on the same page there. Now, what, what I noticed in, in, when you wrote the moral landscape is you, you tell it, and I'm not trying to trap you. You, you tell a story about. It's counter kind of instinct, but you need to come back to this feeling of not wanting to trap the other person. You need to do it often. When you say this congruently, it diffuses the core issue with most arguments, which is that we so easily become identified with our views. After all, they are our views. So when those views are attacked and dismantled, we as individuals feel attacked and dismantled. This does sound extreme, but being trapped in an argument can feel like being trapped by a predator. Which brings us to point four. You need to separate your ego and the other person's ego from the views that you had when you entered the discussion. This is hard. It means recognizing that your views aren't really yours. You pick them up somewhere and you can change them without losing an essential part of yourself. Non identification with your opinion is a huge topic bigger than this video because it's going to affect everything from arguing, your general level of life satisfaction, and many more things. But for the purpose of this video, make it clear that you are not attacking the person. You are merely disagreeing with a particular perspective. And here's one excellent phrase to help you do that. The problem I have with your argument, and this isn't, I don't mean that you're wrong. I, I see what you're doing, I see what you're doing, and as far as I can tell, it's logical. But the problem is, as far as I can tell, problems it doesn't solve, and there's other problems that you don't have to be unsolved or unaddressed. This is especially effective because deep down people are terrified of being wrong. The existential feeling of being wrong in the world is one of the deepest and most common human. This is so about manipulation, how to make it seem like uh, people aren't wrong when they're wrong. There might have been some like non sequitur argument from Peterson a second time, but I don't remember. I'm just going to move on. Okay, so this one was about Ben Shapiro's arguing techniques. I didn't have like as clear of a comment on this. Ben Shapiro is one of the most famous and skilled political leaders out there. And even if you're not in politics, his arguments are fun to watch. I thought it was interesting that like there were certain things he was doing that I, I saw like more skill in. I thought it was, there was some good in what he was doing, whereas the Peterson video like really didn't impress me. This video, um, there's certain things that I liked that he did. like. Uh, not engaging in mudslinging or um so like there was there's one part of this video where some guy's making an appeal to authority and ben is just sort of like so what like that doesn't prove you're right who cares like what you know he was like really unimpressed by appeals to authority he's also good at staying calm um and unemotional so that's i appreciate that i do not like ben shapiro by the way he's um He's on the wrong side politically while pretending to be on our side. And that does a lot of harm when you have like fake representatives and you need to disown these people who do not speak for you, but they claim that they do. And then they put nasty words in your mouth and betray your cause. Uh, and for example, he's been hypocritical and had double standards about, uh, it was like the Roseanne tweet versus some leftist tweet. I think it was Roseanne, maybe someone else. But anyways, there was like a right wing tweet that would offended people and a left wing tweet that offended people. And he like, joined the lynch mob against the right-wing person while defending the left-wing person. And they were like very similar tweets, so it's hypocritical. This is in my blog comments somewhere. You can like search site colon carry.us and then search Shapiro and you can probably find it. Why Ben is so talented in debates? He's done other bad stuff. He got, uh, 
he used to work with David Horowitz, and he no longer does. And uh, David Horowitz is someone I like and respect a lot, but he didn't go into a lot of detail on what happened with the falling out. But um, and there's other stuff like I think Vox Day and Rucka Ali and some others have uh, pointed out Shapiro issues. Specifically, I may give you ten techniques that you can use no matter what side of an argument you represent, even if you're on the wrong side. Yeah, you cannot take that as a a recommendation. The top ones, everyone should read these. These are recommendations. Further reading means it was relevant to the book. Some of them he would recommend, some maybe not. Like it's it's just ambiguous. But there are things he brought up in the book in some way, so he thought that he ought to include them as relevant. Memes that spread are selected for because they spread, then they're it's exactly the same as genes that spread are selected for. The more of a gene is in the next generation, the more it was just selected. Like the whole point of evolution, the issue is replication or spreading. Having lots of great grandchildren or whatever. If a meme doesn't spread, it just won't exist much because it never spread. Oh yeah, so there are a bunch of people in this VDARE article pointed out their hypocrisy, and we got to Ben Shapiro. Shapiro said Gunn's tweets were loathsome, but said that doesn't mean he should have lost his job at Disney. However, Shapiro also said Roseanne played herself in the series, so when she made a new racist reference about Valerie Barrett, her persona was inseparable from her character. Therefore, essentially, Roseanne deserved to be fired. It's not a memory issue, like I have um, far more context and knowledge of David. He generally avoids trashing people, so you can get the wrong idea about what he thinks of them when he's neutral or like slightly positive in some way. Three caveats before we begin. First, I am not saying that Ben is right or wrong on any of his points. What I'm going to discuss are some of the recorded devices he employs that can be persuasive even if they aren't always logically foolproof. No matter where you fall on these issues, there's a lot to be learned from Ben's style of debate. Second, you probably... Let's see what BOI actually said. Is Blackmore the one who made Teams technology memes as like a separate category? I think she was the one who did that and it was like nonsense. Didn't she give a TED talk like that? 
and I took it as meaning she just didn't know what she was talking about. Like, why would that be a fundamental category? She's just sort of making up categories without, um, like, logical or rigor rigorous reasons. Oh. Why would a gene be selected for if it was good at spreading memes? Uh, well, if spreading the memes was beneficial, like if it meant being a charismatic speaker, like let's say being taller helps you spread memes and having a louder voice, that could be selected for because it helps you be like the leader of the tribe, which gets you more food or something, or more, more and better mates. But in general, uh, I think it's more what David talks about. Yeah, I thought that TED Talk was awful. I think that was the thing that I watched from Blackmore. Maybe I read a few quotes as well from the book. I don't know. But it was just like a superficial category. It's like dividing fiction books up into non-fundamental categories, like long fiction books and short fiction books. And, uh, you know, ones with dragons versus ones without dragons. That's like a superficial distinction. Anyways, regarding genetic advantage, I think the important issue is what David talks about is why there would be a genetic advantage for creativity, for intelligence, for being able to learn memes and think and that stuff, which, which David covers. Right, there is, by the way, more fundamental analysis of book plots. Um, that exists, but a lot of analysis is not good. There's the, the hero's journey stuff from Joseph Campbell, and there's some analysis of symbolism and stuff by Jung. I think there's some actual uh, good thinking that went into some of that. But if you read an article like the seven plots of fiction books, they just do a bunch of superficial categories. And that's what the, the technology meme seems like to me. Whereas uh, static and dynamic memes is a, a category with some sort of fundamental importance. There's some like meat to it. Okay, so here's what David says about Blackmore. I believe that the mechanism she proposes would not have been possible. That is a naughty compliment. Also, Blackmore, Blackmore downplay, downplays the element of creativity both in the replication of memes and their origin. So this is saying she doesn't get it. So she doubts that technological progress is best explained as being due to individuals as the conventional narrative. So she's an anti-individual. This is extremely contrary to David's thinking. So basically what David's saying here is she thinks that memes are like puppet masters that control people and take away the importance of individual human beings and their creative thoughts. And she's sort of saying, like, memes rule the world, uh, people don't. And so she, it's anti-human. But they denying the myth of the heroic inventor is a double negative if you take like denying and myth. You could deny that it is a myth, or you could deny it because it's a myth. So the sentence is ambiguous and it ought to have been edited, but uh, we all missed it apparently. Anyways, I, I assume based on context that the book says the heroic inventor is a myth, but it's denying there is a heroic inventor in general. And so if Blackmore is on that side, that's very, very contrary to what David's side of this kind of thing. And so David starts arguing with it. And then he says, worse. So, you know, he's not a fan of Blackmore. And she's, she doesn't understand progress. She doesn't understand the beginning of infinity, the journey of progress. She thinks it's just arbitrary. She recognizes complexity, but not knowledge, progress, um, problem solving. 
because biological evolution doesn't have better or worse, she says, which I think is um, debatable. But in any case, what, what, why would that mean memes don't have better and worse? Because humans have values. So she's basically anti-moral philosophy. Uh, here again, David is saying Blackmore is wrong. So he's using her as a contrast. And to um, he's trying to say he's familiar with the literature and he knows better. Rather than that he's just making stuff up out of context or reinventing the wheel or something. But again, David says she's wrong. He's bending over backwards to give her credit for something, which is realizing memes matter, like just at all in general, even if she got every detail of it wrong. And he says she's right about the basic idea that our brains, brains evolved so they could deal with memes. But this, this is a separate issue from memes as parasites or static memes or any of that. Like mind parasites, because, you know, this applies even if they're only rational memes, which have, you know, beneficial survival value, like directly and more purely. Anyway. Don't want to focus on debating your interpersonal relationships because the goal of debate is quite different than the goal of most relationships. Or you're debating somebody on stage, in which case your goal is basically to humiliate the person as badly as possible. And third, Ben obviously does quite. So Ben is in favor of humiliating people on stage in stage debates, which I think says a lot about what on stage debates are like and why they're not serious truth seeking. Um, and why I think if someone really wants to get to the bottom of the matter and figure out the truth, they should have a written discussion. And you see none of these public intellectuals like Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, etc. They don't do written discussions. David Deutsch used to, at length. He wrote thousands of emails as part of written discussions, as well as comments online and blog posts and so on, uh, to try to truth seek and stuff. He did not focus on having, you know, staged performances where you talk to someone for an hour. Like he's occasionally gone on podcasts and stuff, but that's a very a you know, small part of what he does that he doesn't see he sees that as promotion i think not as actually truth seeking and trying to figure things out and someone like ben shapiro he's just doing promotion like that's what he does rather than truth seeking Now, research is necessary, but I'm more interested in the tactical side of the debate rather than the crap, so I'm going further into it. Let's begin in defense, defensive debate tactics, starting with catching non-arguments. And that's because not everything that sounds persuasive actually constitutes a valid argument. For instance, when you hear that 9 out of 10 fill in the blanks believe something, that doesn't necessarily prove a point. That is an argument from authority. And though it might be compelling, more evidence required. Yeah, so dealing with arguments from authority well is a, a good skill to have if you're going to do show debates and try to impress people. Because, yeah, you, you can catch people making bad arguments, and then you can score points for calling them out. And also, at the same time, you're, like, dealing with bad arguments instead of accepting them, so it's... It's at least like partially good instead of just a bunch of crap. To be deemed conclusive. So when people lean on authority and arguments, then those call malignant, like in this example. We urge you to listen to the American public and to the lawful statements supported by the manufacture of the equipment that was wrong with Reagan. Okay, so, that is wrong If you feel the great right wing presidents of modern times agreed with me. So, another common debate tactic that makes it done on purpose and doesn't constitute. Right, so Ben doesn't care to try to claim Ronald Reagan for his side. He doesn't want to acknowledge Ronald Reagan as an intellectual authority. And by the way, there are other ways you could deal with this. Like, if this guy wants to say Ronald Reagan is an intellectual authority, you'd ask him, so are you going to agree with, like, everything else Ronald Reagan claimed? And the guy would have to say, oh, no, I just agree with him. I just want to say he's an authority when he's disagreeing with the right-wing narrative, but when he says normal right-wing stuff, then he's just being a right-winger. It's, it's kind of ridiculous, but it'll also be off-topic.
Right, Justin, they're just cherry picking, which is not a reasonable way to do it. <clears throat> yeah, Owen Benjamin is a, a questionable guy who is getting deplatformed a lot. Um, he said some interesting things. I first saw him when Jordan Peterson signed up with the Creative Artists Agency, a major Hollywood talent agency, to have them book his speeches. And Be Benjamin Owen said, you know, I used to work for, with those guys, so I know what they're like, and... Jordan Peterson was signing up to have a handler. And Peterson, on the other hand, his rebuttal was to never talk about it, never acknowledge the even potential problem, never address it. Uh, so I lost a lot of respect for Peterson there because I thought he was just signing up with the left. And at a similar time, Peterson uh, tweeted attacking the Supreme Court justice guy. I forgot his name. Um, but it was... Yeah, Trump was like appointing a new Supreme Court justice. And the people on the left were accusing him of being a rapist or whatever. And they were, you know, heavily lying. And Peterson said, was, was he the one who said even if he gets the nomination, he should step down and just re refuse it? Kavanaugh, yeah, him. Brett Kavanaugh. Anyway, Peterson said, some, said something fucking awful about it that just betrayed the right. And Oh, and, and speaking of that, I also saw a bit later some of Jordan Peterson's history that, like, when he was 16 or 20 or something, he was, like, involved with, like, socialism and left-wing political activism. And, you know, he doesn't like Ayn Rand, and he's... You never hear him talking about Mises positively, either. Um, I do not think he's as right-wing as a lot of his fans wish he was. My favorite material from him was always his uh, psychology lectures, which which are mixed. There's lots of flaws, but they have you know good parts and bad parts. And in particular, my favorite parts were the video analysis of Lion King and Pinocchio, where he's going through these stories and showing the symbolism and the meanings and stuff. And I thought that was really interesting how he would do a detailed analysis. And I used some of his techniques to help me analyze um, Frozen and Moana. But he's also, he's said some good short things that are anti-SJW um, about including, like, why women might not want some of the high-paying jobs they don't have, because it's, like, really hard work. So he was making like 30k a month and got demonetized just for saying unpopular opinions. That's so fucked up. This article, of course, is in favor of censorship. And like, I don't agree with him about Jews. I agree with him about some things and not others, but I think he should... He should speak, and he should be able to engage in commerce with people who like what he does and want to buy it.
Yet not all the women actually want to bill 3,000 hours a year while juggling their family and everything else at the same time. That's uh, really fucking hard. And the men who do that, in general, make major sacrifices with some of the other stuff. They're focusing on the Jew stuff because uh, it's like one of the easier targets. But they, they don't actually want to debate Benjamin Owen on some of his other opinions, some of which are reasonable. And then he gets deplatformed from PayPal. Colin Fox Day, a science fiction writer, sounds misleading to me. He's a political commentary, commentary guy. Maybe he also did some science fiction writing? I don't know. But he's like an anti SJW political internet commentator kind of guy. Sadly, his exile has not been complete. What? These people are such assholes. Oh, he's still on Patreon. They should ban him from everything. The fact that YouTube ever got any income just from taking a cut of of what he did is inexcusable. They should have banned him from day one before he made a dime. This is such bullshit. Right, the First Amendment by itself does not say everything, but these companies are in bed with the government in various ways, and also they're committing fraud, so there are a lot of issues that a liberal or libertarian or whatever, by liberal I meant classical liberal, could, uh, could care about here. And on top of that, the guy writing this is so dishonest because he he wants essentially government control over all kinds of stuff. And if you're in favor of government control of all kinds of stuff, why shouldn't the government impose free speech on these companies and say, hey, you're going to be like the new town square, so you have to uh, have, have free speech. That seems like a totally reasonable regulation if you're a big government fan. If you're not a big government fan, you can make other arguments instead of that one. They're just cherry picking whatever they think will help their cause in the moment, in the short term, without worrying about overall consistency. He's so anti-profit too. He like hates trade and commerce. What an asshole. So I'm very pleased to be talking with Dr. David this morning. It seems to me that he's one of Canada's most outstanding psychologists and perhaps you can say that about psychologists in the world. One of the most outstanding psychologists in the world. Uh, my objection to Adrian Ray's book was uh, that I think he vast, you know, he, there's definitely evidence that many kinds of uh, violent criminal offenders have got something wrong with their brains. Adrian Ray wants to extrapolate to the conclusion that violent criminals and indeed criminals in general have got something broken about their brains. And it's like criminality is pathological. Well, criminality is not pathological. People steal for cost benefit related reasons. Um, the crime is a if you like, kind of social construction in the sense that uh, certain behaviors are criminalized by a larger social group in order to deter them because self interested individuals would otherwise pursue them. You know, people stop exploiting others, stealing from others uh, by criminalizing those activities and imposing penalties. And you know, the rational choice of street of theorizing the criminology that, that other people like Adrian Ray just dismiss out of hand, no, no, criminal offenses are pathological. Yeah, and I think that's silly. I agree with Dr. Peterson. Martin Daly is one of the greatest psychologists in the world, and that says something about the state of psychology. Well, first, it's true that there are people who are biological determinists who don't understand the role of the mind, but Daly doesn't understand the role of the mind either. You can see this with this false dichotomy view that is being put onto pathology. So the view here is that pathology is just something that's wrong with you as a meat machine. That's all you are, and if there's something wrong with you, it's just one of your components is broken. That's what pathology is. And the alternative to that is that you're functioning fine, and so whatever you do is just a result of the combination of biological and social deterministic forces acting on you. So, so both sides here are deterministic. One side just says, well, you're biologically determined, and if you do something wrong, it's part of your biology is messed up. And that's what's going on when people commit criminal behavior. And the other side says, the daily side says, no, that's not what's happening with crime. Crime is an arbitrary social construct, and just because somebody's doing it, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with this biological behavior. And the other side says, the daily side says, no, that's not what's happening with crime. Crime is an arbitrary social construct, and just because somebody's doing it, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with this biology. That's just how you would act if, if you were biologically normal in these circumstances. That's just the deterministic social forces impinging upon you. That's just how it works. Now he makes a show about how he's, oh, yeah, I guess social constructionism as if he means it in some other way, in some way other than the way that people make fun of. No, he does not. He means it exactly in the way everyone else means it. He means crime is just, as he says, just an arbitrary construct. 
is just a subjective concept. To him, crime means activities that are against the interest of the majority. With interest here defined as God knows what. That itself is subjective, presumably. That there needs to fade. If you watch the whole thing, you will see that Bailey has Marxist premises. So we can see that in, in the clip I just showed with his crime as a result of cost and benefit analysis view. As if what is motivating criminals is just, well, I mean, if I can, you know, if I can rob this TV from Walmart and I can get away with it, then I'm getting the TV without having to pay for it. That is, that is such a dumb, naive, simpleton view of crime. And this is a psychology. The way to size is a social signal. And he ought to be trying harder to get social signals out of his videos. Like, he's been doing that for years. So I guess it's either intentional or, like, he's okay with it. He's not trying to stop. I say like sometimes. And I've I've put a little bit of effort in saying it a little bit less. But mostly I just don't care that much. I care more about saying um than like. Because I think like is more of a legitimate word that's actually useful uh, a significant amount of the time. Whereas um is, like, always kind of useless. I don't say it much. Um does indicate, it communicates that you're still thinking, like you're working on it, so that it's something, but most of the time it's unnecessary. Oh, I circled the date of November 2017 when this video was made. So no, he did not stop using face cam. This is not his latest video. Anyways. If I think that one of my, like, habits or whatever is significantly bad, like a significant problem, I put more work into changing it and not doing it. And I think two would do the same thing himself. And so I take his continued sighing as indicating that he thinks sighing is fine, if not good. Like, it's either intentional, or at least he doesn't mind it. And I think that that's bad, that the sighing is overly social, and it's a nonverbal way of attacking stuff that doesn't say a reason. It just sort of means I don't like this, and it's a a social signal of that. So I do not like that kind of social signaling. And I think two being okay with it is a a little bit of not being fully objectivist because Ayn Rand uh, criticized social metaphysics and various other related things. I don't think she thought sighing was a good way of communicating uh, about ideas. One of the greatest in the world, according to Jordan Peterson. <laughs> and the sign is like, it's a bad sense of life. It's sort of saying like he's unhappy, he's disappointed with the world. Um, it, it shows like a, a negativity that is common with two, who also drinks way too much alcohol. And then talks about being unhappy sometimes and lonely and sad and that there's no good people in the world. But he won't speak to me, he won't give me a chance. And there's a lot of other people who he won't give a chance. And some of the people he won't give a chance to, he might like if he got to know them a little more. And then he complains there's no one. So it's not like he's flooded with too many people to try. You know, he doesn't have enough people, and then he's super, won't even give people a chance to talk with him at all. Won't consider if they might have any points that he doesn't know. Might be interesting people, might be smart, whatever. He's very close to people, and then complains he's alone. Which it's totally different with me. Like, I complain there's not enough good people in the world, but I'm super open to giving people a shot, talking to anyone. I talk to a wide variety of different people all the time. I mean, you know who the best psychologists in the world are? Authors. And I talk to them in, like, way more uh, detail. Because, like, two does Q&A streams, just like Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris probably does. Um, where he'll take, like, listener questions, viewer questions. Not just the um the podcast where he takes uh like pre submitted questions, but he does um Patreon only streams. You can you just have to pay him a dollar a month, and then you can go on his Patreon streams and ask him questions in real time. Uh, similar to I know Jordan Peterson has done monthly Patreon streams a while back, or no, it was monthly streams for everyone. But if you're a patron, he prioritizes your questions over non patrons. That's what Peterson did. Um. And so you're getting questions in real time while you're streaming. And the normal way that works is basically there aren't follow-up questions or very little. Whereas I'll actually, you know, discuss or debate with people and have a back and forth with many follow-ups. Um, so there's a major difference there. I mean, good authors with good characterization skills. They are applied psychologists. They have to actually understand how people function and in order to present them plausible. Even if they're just using stock characters or archetypes, you still have to be better than a psychologist in order to do that. I am one of the greatest psychologists in the world. I ran with certainly the greatest psychologists who ever lived in the center field. field. Now, this isn't saying much. 
Like that's not that's not self aggrandizement. That says more about the pathetic state of the field. My friend used to say, regarding psychology, we are in the state where philosophy. I, I agree with him that the field of psychology is, in general, quite bad, and that authors are some of the people who know something about psychology in order to write. I, yeah, I agree with those things. There, there are there is some decent work in psychology. I think some of the the symbolism stuff from Young and some of the hero's journey stuff is is decent work, and there, there's some value in it. Partially, it's none of it's like fully correct, but you can get some good points out of it. Uh, but the field as a whole is like mostly crap. And it's it's very pseudosciencey lately. Like it really wants to be a real proper science instead of a discipline of philosophy, and that has led them astray. Um, all of their correlation studies are not helping them understand people. And you know, the parts that I said were partially good are older psychology work that is not correlation studies or research. It is, you know, trying to understand people and write about it. It's more conceptual and philosophical. Philosophy was, at the time of Thales, Thales aggregated water, based on some simple observations you probably saw. Well, people need water to survive, animals do, plants do, there's a rain cycle, it rains, there's the ocean. So maybe water is whatever everything hasn't gone. Now, it's that kind of primitive hypothesizing on the basis of scant few observations. That's where we are regarding psychology. It is not this developed advanced field. Harry Binswanger says the following, and it's true. We are talking about a field that has only in the past few decades admitted the existence of its subject matter. Behaviorism used to be the big thing, it still is. Jordan Peterson's a fan of it anyway. And this is the idea that mind doesn't matter if it exists at all, and really we just study how people react and how they behave physically. Your mind is superstition, don't worry about that. That's not what psychology is about. <sighs> now, psychology has gotten better with things like cognitive therapy, but we're still very low. So, and this is ideology. This is principles. This is integration. This is philosophy. It's powerful. If you have the right one, it brings revolutionary clarity. If you have the wrong one, it makes you more confused than common sense ever could. And so it's not hard to be one of the greatest psychological minds in the world today. If you just use common sense and introspect, you are at the head of the pack. You are near the front of the race. Because all the people in the field are running in the wrong direction. They're going the wrong way around the track. So you can be going at a lackadaisical pace, and as long as you're strolling in the right direction, you are one of the greatest psychological minds there is. Anyway, so there is such a thing as diseases that affect your mind and which you have no control over. But there are also pathologies that are the result of your volitional choice. Okay, so my zap thing worked. It submitted the stream to Twitter, and it did it an hour ago, and the stream started an hour ago. So perfect. I don't think I can differentiate between streams and videos, so I just made the text say either one. But yeah, this is good. Andrew Neff liked your tweet. So that is a person who I don't know who they are. And they don't even follow me. But somehow they saw it. Anyways, it'll it'll help a few more people see this. And you know, I don't want to put like a lot of effort into that. Uh, you know, if someone really cares, they can just, uh, you know, subscribe to me on YouTube and get email notifications. However, I'm happy to put effort into, you know, automated stuff that's pretty easy to set up and then works by itself so that people can use Twitter more. That's fine. And I think most people most of the time fall into the second category. They're, they're problems too. They're psychological problems too. They're told the only thing that exists is the first category. So you build. I'm not saying. I could do a Facebook one too, except I really don't like Facebook. And yeah, I think I'm just not going to. But uh, I could also do it somewhere else. Like, is there somewhere else I should put it? Announcements. I could make it like an automated blog comment announcement. That seems kind of silly. I don't think I need that. Maybe I could automate it on Discord. Let's see. I think I still have my newsletter posted on Facebook because uh, I think MailChimp has Facebook and Twitter support built in, so I just turned it on. I don't care if it goes there, but I don't really care one way or another. Uh, anyways, okay, make a zap. I'm going to see if I can do automated, put it on Discord. Uh, Discord. I added Discord to my favorites. I don't know why it wasn't showing up. Anyways. Oh, no, wait. No, I want to start with YouTube. 
And then I want to do Discord second. New video. All right, continue. Continue. Username is Curie42. Sure, we'll do the test. Okay, cool. Do this. Now we do Discord. Select action. Send channel message. Awesome. I think this is going to work. Sign into Discord. Password does not match. Okay. I'll pull this back over. They're making me do this CAPTCHA now. Traffic lights. Okay. Traffic lights. Discord. Fallible ideas. Continue. Pick a channel. FI. Message text. Uh. Oh, and then you have to have this plus thing, and you pick title, and then you hit space, and then you pick YouTube URL. New streamer video title URL. Perfect. Bot name? No. No. Continue. Send a test message. Sure, why not? Oh, it deleted it right away. No, wait, no, it didn't. It's just the preview disappeared. Oh. So Zapier is now on my server. It just logs in for a moment, I guess. Oh, okay. Back to setup. I'm going to put my name in it because it got sent from Zapier. Oh, wait, you can set the uh, the name. Okay, watch this. Bot name, Curie Bot. Oh, and I can set a bot icon even. Can I just set my own? Oh, full URL of an image. Okay. We got some red icons here. Okay, we have a blank red icon. And then I'm gonna rename. Okay. Okay, so that should work. Retest the step. All right, send test. I don't see the icon. Maybe I have icons disabled or something. There we go. 
That didn't work. Oh, that, I gave the right URL. Whatever. I don't care if it works, really. Oh, well, if it's not going to work, it'd be better to have the original icon. So, I'm going to edit action. Oh, I know it didn't work. It's because of my, my Cloudflare shit, which I still have enabled. Anyways, I'll just turn that off. And then say done editing. So turn on zap. Okay, so now it will auto send to Discord in the future. That's pretty cool. Okay, where was I? I was watching two. Action take those people. I think people don't need themselves as they think they do. And that's not because their problems are an illusion or subjective or the mind doesn't really exist. It's because they are the cause of their problems. You don't like to hear that, but if you have a psychological problem, it's probably your fault. If you're depressed, that is not because there's just something wrong with your brain. I mean, it's not necessarily because of that. Or just because you're in circumstances where that's how you have to be. No, it depends on how you thought about it and how you acted in your circumstances. You can be in the same circumstances, same brain, and be happy or depressed. And when I say the same brain, I mean you have the same brain as a starting point. Your brain is going to look exactly the same if you're depressed as well if you're happy. What I'm saying is the brain was not a fundamental cause that was your free will making changes in the brain. So anyway, just this false dichotomy view is so stupid. The idea that everything is biological, and so anything wrong is pathology, physical pathology, or the view that everything we say is wrong, that's just our interpretation on it. There's no such thing as wrong. So it's not the biology messing up, it's just that we are subjectively claiming that it's wrong. God, this idea of crime. <laughs> crime is just an arbitrary categorization to which we attach moral significance as a cynical or evolutionary thing in order to deter people from taking certain actions. As if stealing, you know, robbing a liquor store, there's nothing really different about that from you know, starting a restaurant. There's, really, there's, there's nothing actually different about those in reality. It's just that most people benefit from the restaurant entrepreneur, and they don't from the, <laughs> the liquor store robber. And so we just artificially distinguish those arbitrarily, subjectively, and then claim for some, you know, we put some moral stigma on robbing a liquor store, even though there really isn't by any objective standard. <sighs> That's what one of the greatest psychologists in the world believes, according to Dr. Pierce. I mean, greatest, according to Dr. Pierce. It's funny because this guy's actually an example of something Jordan Pierce kind of understands, but not really. This idea that if you're being straight, then postmodernism doesn't really have a viewpoint. But he uses Marxism because that's, that's just what they're falling back on, and that's in fact what they were trying to justify. It's involved in what they're trying to justify. And that's what Daly is an example of. He's just subjective, and then, oh well, but he falls back on his Marxist premises. You know, ideas don't matter, it's all, really, it's all just material gain, and then we just rationalize that. I do not recommend you watch this whole thing. That's hopefully that's part of the value I'm providing to you, as I watch this trash and digest it. Warning. Anyway, what's funny is Jordan Pearson does understand that that's exactly what he is as a pragmatist, which is what he is. A valuable. Pragmatists just do what works. Well, what works? You just do what works. You have no principles. You have no way to tell what to do in any situation. So you just fall back on whatever is big in the culture. Which is why Jordan Pearson is just a gross amalgamation of every idea you can find in the culture, every bad one anyway. As I said elsewhere, people steal as a way of fighting reality. That's what they're doing. They view the law as a proxy for identity, which is itself the uh, rule of existence. So when they steal, they don't care about getting something for nothing. Or rather, they do, but in a metaphysical sense. It's not just I want this TV without paying for it. It's I want to prove that I don't have to pay for things, in general, in principle. This is why they are always more concerned with getting away with it than with whatever it was. And I don't mean just they have to get away with it in order to enjoy their spoils. What I mean is, they actually don't care that much about what they're stealing. They don't even go into it caring about that. It's more of a test for them. Can I get away with this? And if I can, that means I can do whatever I feel like. Reality doesn't bind me. Everybody faces the choice at some point. Oh, my feelings and, and wishes, my subjective products of my consciousness, don't change reality. So now I can respond to that one of two ways. I can conform to reality, or I can refuse to, and wage war on reality. Now, one manifestation of refusing to is theft. It's just a way of saying I have to prove myself. That I don't have to follow reality, and I can get away with it. And it's also a way for any people to do say loyalty to reality. You know, people running the business, the people from whom these creeps are stealing. There is a black and white difference between the hedge fund manager and the liquor store robber. It's not just multiple just doing what's in their self-interest, in their actual self-interest, in their context. No, the hedge fund manager is looking at reality and acting in harmony with it in order to create values in a non-contradictory way. The hedge fund manager is working with reality. The liquor store robber is waging war against it, and everyone else who is working in harmony with it. The hedge fund manager is working in harmony with it and helping everyone else who is his ally with reality. Anyway, what I really want to get across here is just how awful psychology is today, and how even people regarded as the best in the world are worse than your average person in this field. So just keep that in mind and don't give any kind of deference to somebody just because they studied psychology. In fact, uh, that would make me more skeptical of their advice. Okay, so this one I wanted to look at. I think it was this? Yeah. The web page was not working on mobile, so let's try it here. Oh, and it totally worked. I did request desktop site on mobile and it still wouldn't work. I'm in Chrome so I can speed it up. The thing is that that's not as powerful force as that plane. That, you know, this, this is part of the plan. 
And the thing that they fear most is an awakening. They don't want America to wake up and see what's really going on because they fear that awakening. They fear when people understand that their constant, that, 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 that the spirit of the Constitution is being so flagrantly undermined at a fundamental level, and that's a one-way street. They know that people are going to be upset. That's the reason why they sent police to my house to do a wellness check, you know, because I might be suicidal. Well, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to get into that. Let, let's talk about what happened um, because I told, told you uh, before off camera that I did through this, and um, you showed me a video, which I wish I had my stuff on video, uh, which was disturbing. But I had almost laughed because it's so textbook of what happened to me. Like, and, and if I laughed and you thought I was like a dick, I wasn't trying to be like a jerk. But it's just like a walk down memory lane. This was eight years ago in my life, and you look, I looked at the video, I'm like, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. Like a chuckle, not a laugh. Yeah. But um, you on the video. Uh, well, yeah, explain, why don't you just say that? Okay. And then I'll, I'll throw my two so what happened is that's it's too quiet right i think it's too quiet it's a little bit quiet for me and it looked too quiet on the on the volume indicators so let's see sound oh wait i maxed everything didn't i oh no uh I show you audio capture, Max. I think I maxed everything. Try this again. I'm in San Francisco. I get this letter from you know this this high priced law firm, and the law firm well, has right, demands. Let's... And um and the demands are they want to know whether I retained Google's documents the way I gave it to if I had retained it, um and whether they can search through all my documents to um to to, to delete it. All right. And so um I I can't help but be honest. And um and so what I do is I, I answer honestly. You know um. I told Google I retained, I retained okay, that's way like, too loud yes, now. like I did give them, I gave them away, and the people I gave it to were law enforcement, you know, because a crime had been committed. And if I didn't do that, then that would be part of that, you know, that would be part of that collusion. Well, that didn't work very well. Okay, so the one thing was making their background noise really loud. Um, let's see if we can add an effect. Do any of these let you make stuff louder? Justin, I know you've worked with some of these. Uh, AU filter? What's an AU filter? No, that's not what I want. What's this? I guess you can just raise everything. Is there like a raise all button? A vocal booster, maybe that'll help a little. But it seems like I could just manually raise every single one. Yeah, I have RX Boost installed. Like it showed up in Audio Hijack, but I'm not seeing it here. I know I could, um, run stuff through like loopback or audio hijack or something. Yeah, I'm just gonna try the vocal boost. Yeah, yeah the accomplice. And so um so I sent them the letter back and uh Google decided to call a wellness check. Okay. Um and so the, the problem with Google is that they actually sent them to the wrong address. They sent them to the wrong address, they sent them to my friend's house. Right. Um and so they arrived at my friend's I house. I think this is better. And, uh, they didn't believe them that I wasn't there. And they stuck around and they gave this impression that they really wanted to right? So um the police came to my house and, uh, you know, they, they were banging on the door, and I was just like, mm, it's not going to answer it. Like, they didn't announce who they were, um, and so I didn't answer the door. Well, uh, they decided to, um, they decided that something that they saw on my porch was a, um, looked like a bomb, and it was just a canister of, like, alcohol that was used for um, fire dancing that my roommate does. And so they said, well, this, this looks like a bomb, and so they called in the bomb squad. They shut down three blocks of Valencia Street. Okay, so it's a busy place. Yeah. Yeah, I got called in, um, uh, officers with um, assault rifles uh, were stationed on the street, and there were people on the roofs, and people are not going to believe me when I say this. I'm going to say it anyways, because this is what really happened. There were snipers on the opposing rooftops across the street from me, okay? And uh, I'm, alone, I'm all alone, and I was like, why are the, and the only thing I can see out the front was that there's a police car parked on the other side of the road. And I was like, why are the police still here? And so my friend, who you know just had the police at his place, and he was in the police for county, right? So he's like, you know what? I got that feeling to go visit Zach. He's he's going to so he heads into the city. He gives me a call. He's like, Zach, they have your, your they have your street locked off for three blocks. Okay. Um, turns out they had evacuated the whole block. The Marsh Theater was evacuated. Um, you know, there's there's, there's snipers, there's SWAT, there's FBI, um, and they're trying to call me, and then they start texting me, telling me that they're not going to go away unless I like come out. They're just going to stay there until I come out because they have to make sure that I'm. Okay. What a fucking abuse of power, Jesus. Right. Well, um. I, I, you know, my, my friend gives me a call, he's like, yo man, they've got, you know, there's all these law enforcement here, and they've got bomb robots at your front door. And so, I, I was like, come on man, you gotta be joking me. I go downstairs. Well, before you get there, you're inside the place, right? Inside the place. And you're saying, what are you saying to yourself? I've been through this, so I'm just curious what's going through your head. No, here's the thing, it's like, there's no way that, I don't know, right? So, what happened is that I'm hearing this helicopter, and I see, like, a police parked outside. And I, you know, and I say to myself, there's no way that they've got a police helicopter. That's silly, you know? Like, this isn't for me. You're in a movie. I'm in a movie. No, this isn't for me. This happens in Hollywood. Like, they're not sending a helicopter after me, but it's not circling overhead. I was like, it must be like a murder, and it's just coincidental right. that, you know, that, that it just happened to be next yeah. to me, because that's, that's the rational, like, conclusion that it just happens to be around me. But no, they had, there's two news helicopters flying overhead because there was a, the whole, like, three sections of the block were blocked off. 
and um, and there's and the neighbors are on the rooftops with their cameras trying to figure out like is this a hostage situation. And so my friend he tells me all this. I, I would not believe him. And he's like, yo man, I just look outside your door. There's two you know uh, bomb robots. And um and I went downstairs. I took my phone. And I got video of two bomb robots inside my gate with this like with this mechanical arm coming in to like remove this alcohol container. <laughs> well, I mean, more than that, then you decide at some point you say. I, so, I gotta go outside. Yeah, pretty much. But, but I guess before we get there, is there any part in, in your thoughts you say, man, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad? Yeah. Well, what I think is that, um, you know, um, I knew I had a friend that got real sad and she called, um, she called the suicide hotline. Yeah. And they came and arrested her and put her in jail for 24 hours. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, Google doesn't like the fact that, like, they, they see this emergency. Like, they, they know what's gonna happen when the public sees their internal documents. They know what I have. And so what they found is that they have created an emergency with the police and that they're going to come in, they're gonna arrest me, they're gonna search my house, they're gonna, they're gonna take everything as evidence, and Google's gonna try to figure out what I have and get rid of it and try to stop the damage. And so, don't forget, you are arrested. Anything could happen to you if you're arrested. Everything could happen. I mean, people are like, oh, it's true. And you don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, the volume levels on this video are really bad. Um, how much they vary? Police, if you get put in a holding cell, you don't know what's gonna happen. Here, I'll show. So, it's, it's a different world. world. So I was like, I don't want them to grab me and pull me off the street and right. stop, stop this mission. Anyway. Uh, but you know, my best friend, he, he's down there, he's negotiating with the police, and he's like, look, like, you know, um, um, and they're like, we're not gonna go away until he's come out. Like, we're gonna be here, the cops, we're gonna be here in chefs, we're gonna be here for, you know, the day, two days, whatever it takes until we talk to Zach. And so I said, uh, you know, I was just like, you know, like, look, we're not gonna arrest you. We have six questions. We're gonna ask you. We're not gonna place you under arrest. We're just doing a wellness check because Google called because Google called in and said that you were uh, that you might be suicidal. They got the guns on. They got the guns on me. So you know, I I put on a jacket and I said, well, you know, if they're not yeah, just Zach goes between green, yellow, and red, he's not too bad. He's mostly in yellow. But then the other guy, like the interviewer, is way quieter. Let me go. It's not like I can sneak out, you know, and call the plane and go to Washington D.C. I was like, I gotta face this, you know. And if, if I'm going to 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 disappear or something bad's gonna happen, I mysteriously end up dead. And you know, let the camera see what what happened before I did that. Right. And that way, that people can find out the truth. And if they're going to offer me, they're going to silence me. Then let it be in the light of the public view. So you know, uh, my friend had his iPhone. He had his camera rolling the entire time. Show something on here. Yeah, you want to see it? Yeah, sure. Right. So just don't compromise your phone numbers or anything like that. I thought this guy was like exaggerating a bit in the Veritas interview or when he was talking about making like a dead man switch. And then they literally sent snipers to his fucking house. Um. Like, even now, like, he sounds, like, a little paranoid, if you know what I mean. Except that the snipers actually went to his house, and they shut down multiple blocks in San Francisco. Like, what the fuck? Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. the next thing you know, some maniacs will be gone. Gonna, yeah. And this is because he leaked documents from Google to Veritas. He doesn't have, like, guns. He's not violent, you know? It's... There's no need for massive police force to deal with him. No, that wouldn't happen. And oh, it happens. This is what happens when you are a whistleblower. So, here you go. Here's, here's the street view. This is you coming down the street. Coming down. Put your hands up. That was smart. I mean, you look fashionable, but the jacket. Don't come out with the jacket. It is so cold. It is, cold. It is so cold. They're just standing there, like, in front of the bank. Right out of the bank. They're taking it to the side. They're coming 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 to the side. I also want to show you the uh, people like, no, bomb robots that happened, right? And like, it's going to be hard to see, but what you're going to see is you're going to see a robot outside with a hand. I'm going to to my house because they think that something looks suspicious. They've got yeah, two, 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 two bomb robots, a big one and a small one. And then for some reason, my phone stopped before they thought I'd call. Um, so, the one you're getting arrested is particularly, not arrested, but uh, detained is particularly disturbing. Yeah. I don't know what you did. Like, well, they, they thought that I might be suicidal or playing violence. And so, so they yeah. shut down three city blocks, call the FBI, put snipers on the roof. I mean, if I, you know, I could have been shot, and then they would have been like, oh, well, you know, he made a sudden movement or something, or we thought he was going for a gun, like, that would have just been right there. Well, so it didn't happen at any time. Happened so you had a gun? Yeah. I mean, I've seen crazy stuff happen. I was fortunate when they came to my home that nothing like it's rare that you'll see, hear a guy who says the FBI was pretty good yeah. when they break into your house and threaten you, but they, they, I thought they were professional in a certain um, manner. But at least they can have it. Yep. A guy who's first time in could be a little edgy. Mm -hmm. Something slips, somebody gets hurt, things get escalated, right? Um, that's why situations like that, I don't have to tell anybody and don't tell you. Are. I think the white cameras are so good. It's a little frightening. When you're on the other end of it, you're staring down the guns and stuff, you're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. I'm a software guy. I work in tech, now I got guns, I got helicopters, I got FBI, I got police. This is a little bit. It's a combo. Like, it's a combo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much money are wasting? Like, these people could be stopping crime. Instead, they're going after a whistleblower, you know, who's trying to inform the American public on how their system is being subverted. But let's also take a step back. You haven't even gone public yet. No, so I this didn't. is all just from this is uh, an interview that you did with your voice changed, your face not seen, your name not used. A lot of the details we talked about here today were not discussed because uh, obviously to protect who you were and how long you worked at Google and things like that, a lot of details weren't, weren't discussed. So, and they're, they've, they've lost their minds over this. Mm -hmm. So obviously the information you have is very well guarded and they want to give that much of that way down. So that's, that's how damaging these documents are. And I know it and Google knows it. And pretty soon everyone's going to know about it. So I am much safer doing what I'm doing now than, you know. Yeah, Alan, it's like that a lot where they use force against suicidal people. <laughs> They're ridiculous sometimes. Cowering in fear. Like, I just only want to wait forward. Like, I can't back down at this point. They've got me, they got my back to the wall. At, at, at the best, my life would have been completely destroyed. They would have put me into bankruptcy. Um, going forward, they may still put me into bankruptcy, but they're not going to kill me. Um, you know, hopefully. It's like, don't kill yourself. You could have been rubbed out that day. Could have rubbed out that day. Just, I mean, let's not. We're both adults. We're both on the hot seat. Those events are set up specifically in case you, maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you had a bad week. And no, we talk about no sleep, right? You know yourself. Maybe you're a grouch bastard. And you're like, and you come out, get the fuck out of here. And it's hostile. We got hostile. You know, I, I read an article the other day where the police killed a guy. So he he was like an old guy and he had some guns and his like aunt or something or like some female relative
and they came at fucking 5 a.m. in the morning to wake him up and take his guns. As like, you're making the chance of a bad outcome a lot higher. Why couldn't you just come in the afternoon? There's actually a different story I heard about the other day. Um, a daycare did not have like proper permitting or whatever, and it had been running for like months. And then the police came and shut it down in the middle of the day, and then they called all the parents and made them like leave work to come get their kids because the daycare got shut down. And they could have just come and shut it down at like 5 p.m. when everyone went home, and they just did it in the middle of the day with no regard for reasonable timing. And so police are not always very uh, reasonable about doing something in the safest way. Like, the snipers made it less safe, not more safe. They didn't have to do it that way. They could have done it in a different way. They were not taking reasonable precautions for their own safety here. They were, they were screwing up. And it's because Google is politically powerful. They don't do this for everything. Those situations are... Like, sometimes they screw up with any random people, but, like, this level of effort, that was because it's Google. For a reason. It's not only harassment. They want to see, I want to harass him. We're also going to see if we can find any daylight to ramp this up. If he gives us any lip, if he's aggressive in any manner, if he has a roommate maybe who is one or one, if he has a roommate who has a weapon, or uh, we feel he's trying to hide something, where we can escalate some type of situation. So that was a dangerous situation. You were lucky to navigate the way you did. I mean, that's how I see it through my prison, my experience being in cell, things like that. And also being on the other end of the gun. Guns like you were. I've been there twice. Mm -hmm. And... You just gotta be cool. And, you know, you came out, you had your hands up, that's all you can do. And, and to a certain extent, you're like, that's the craziest roller coaster ride you'll ever be on. Because you don't, when those hands go up and you see those guns, you're like, I don't know where this is going. This is it. Cause... And your brain is telling you that this isn't really happening. Oh, you're watching it? Yeah. Your brain is telling you that this isn't really happening. It's like, it's like, right? right? it's like you know, this is what it looks like on TV. Yeah. You don't see the actual guns pointing at you, you see pointing at somebody else. And so, I mean, you know, and that's the thing is that, you know, my advice for anybody that's, you know, swatted, you know, or faced a similar situation is, um, you know, if you can, video record it and make sure as many people see it as possible because, you know, if they're going to, if they're going to opt you off, then let it be as operationally complex for them to deal with that. And if it becomes too complex, they're not going to want to. I mean, you know, even if a police officer is, is corrupted and they're on the dole, these big tech companies, like at the end of the day, their allegiance is to themselves, right? Like they may be, they may be selfish, but they're not going to screw over themselves. And so the thing is, is that, you know, you have to make it so that if you go down, they're going to face a lot of heat. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that I wasn't, um, that I didn't, I'm happy that I didn't answer the door anyway because when there's a police officer, they just grab my hands and they'd be like, you're danger, we're holding you. And then, oh, we thought that he was trying to destroy evidence, so they just go in my place and they just grab everything. And that's, that's what could happen. You don't know what you're doing with, what you're doing with, um, all, the, all the mechanisms behind them. Yeah. But like you said, people, you can sit there and say, oh, you know, you're talking about getting whacked. Like, this is real. This is, this is big. This is, it happens all the time. This is big. It's big. It's, uh, it's massive. Yeah, I'm so being like built. I'm always not afraid to disrupt the status quo. Telling fresh stories. Bring the life characters who until now have been confined to a market. Why is it being so slow? Come on. Well, you can see all the police in chat. Update your floor. This is a Chrome extension called Video Speed Controller. Floors with Empire today's fifty dollars room sale. Buy one room, get floors for all other rooms for just fifty dollars each. So when you buy one room, it's only fifty dollars for family in the kitchen, fifty dollars for carpet in the bedroom, and fifty dollars for hardware in the office. There's no limit. Buy one room, and it's fifty dollars for floors in each single room. Schedule now. Eight hundred five eight eight two three hundred Empire today. Your government's involving suspicious device to shut down streets in San Francisco for about three hours. We say the device was not a threat. Sky Seven shows you the scene on Valencia Street in the Mission District. The Marsh Theater on Valencia says it was evacuated. A bomb squad robot investigated the device. Roads reopened shortly after seven tonight. Again, it was not dangerous. Oh, this one's just a photo. I just got married like uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago. Uh, I don't know why people clap at that like it's some kind of accomplishment. Like, if I just grew up cancer, probably everybody should stand up and give me a standing go. But I got married, if you break it down, getting married, I just basically found somebody somewhere in this universe and go, all right. It's not that tough. Some of you guys have done it a couple times, I'm sure. It's weird, though, like, when I got engaged, like, when a girl gets engaged, you go, go out, they have a big party, they go celebrate, right? Let's go to Applebee's. <laughs> it's two for 20. 
you know, for a guy not so much long, and I got engaged, nobody was happy for me. And it wasn't because I didn't like my fiance, I just had a weird reaction to it. I sent a text, yeah, I just got engaged, this is what I got back. Why? <laughs> what, you knock her up? <laughs> Fucking homo. I just got married like uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago. Not... I don't know why people clap at that, like it's some kind of accomplishment. Uh, like, I just grew a cancer. Okay, back to pocket. Oh yeah, this article is interesting. I was gonna put it in my newsletter. The beginning's bad, the guy's like an environmentalist, but then uh, you just go past the first few paragraphs and he goes through four different large geoengineering projects and they're all interesting. So that'll show up in my newsletter at some point. What's this? Oh, this is just a fantasy book. I saw it advertised and I was gonna like read a little bit about it to see if I might want to try it. All right, let's read this. So this is here. Oh yeah, I was going to respond to that on stream. Uh, then also, I wanted to check my subscriber count. I don't know if I get notified or not. About 159 subscribers. Actually, I'll do this, or no, this takes some time. Let's read the Riesman thing. Um, these numbers are wrong. Like, a foot is 12 inches. The conversion factor is 12. To go from feet to inches, you multiply by 12. That's not going to take away that many zeros. So normally I would retweet this, but he made a math error, so I'm not going to. I'll retweet my own tweet. Alright, delete that one. This is half an hour. Uh, not right now. The stream's not going to be going that much longer.
Oh, that's just art. This is um a patio eleven recognition. I think I already got this book, but I was gonna check because I saw it again and I wasn't sure. Yep, I have that book on my iPhone right now, so I can just delete it from here. Okay, and now I'm going to look at this comment. I know what email that's related to. Here's the email. Oh wait, that's Anne's. I wanted my response. Okay, so Wayne Agony. Oh, I should get a timestamp. So I'm starting this at uh, an hour and 37 minutes. Well, like, I'll add 30. We're now up to 38. Whatever, I'm just going to put 38. Okay. Right, so we need to read the question. Uh, you answer an email regarding a technique, teaching technique from Peacock, and he doesn't see what's wrong with it. So he's missing a lot of context, like taking children seriously. com slash taking children seriously with hyphens. Um, so I was replying to Anne, who is familiar with uh, parenting and educational philosophy stuff. And then also to be more, and by the way, this at the end of the article, there it links to more resources and stuff. There's lots of material. And then more specifically, let's look at the, uh, the specific stuff Peacock said. But yeah, I was responding to someone who's already familiar with a bunch of background knowledge. Uh, so I was giving info relevant to Anne about where Peacock is coming from. Uh, so what did Peacock say? Who knows what the grammarians call a part of a sentence which is not an actual sentence, like for instance, just is open. Do you know what that's called when a fragment when you fragment a sentence into parts, what do you think you call the fragment? You call it a fragment, right? Very good. So this is pushy, manipulative, and dishonest. It wasn't very good. Like this very good at the end is not true. Like very good would have been knowing it in advance, I guess. Although why, why do they need to know that in advance? There's like lots of things you could potentially call it. And he just starts saying the answer twice just to try to get them to say it as if because he's so focused on class participation. Like, if he gets them to say the word before he says the answer is X, if they've already said X, no matter how big a hint he gives them, he thinks that's, like, more class participation, and now they're learning more. And most of the people are just sitting there waiting to be told what the answer is because they came to the class to find out what the answer is. So they don't want to be, like, screwed with in this way. It's not useful. It's not helpful. Like, telling people why the word is a certain way is fine, but putting in the form of a question and pretending like they should already know or should be answering is maybe like a couple people like it, but most of them are just going to find it annoying. They don't want to talk and getting them to talk at all when they don't want to is bad. Like you shouldn't be pushing people to talk. You don't want to talk. If you get them to actually want to talk, that's one thing. But here he was socially pressuring the class. Like if no one talks, he's going to keep bugging them probably, unless maybe he gives up. And it like looks like everyone's a coward. But he's putting pressure on them. He's not acting as their helper or client. Like, if you are a service provider in general in a capitalist economy, a you know, a waitress or a massage person or a personal trainer or whatever, 
you try a lot harder than this to please the customer. You don't bug them about stuff. You try to provide whatever they want. You're happy to give them the answer without them having to do work or somehow earn it. Ecoff does this kind of thing repeatedly in the lectures. Um, it's a very common teachery thing where the idea is if you tell kids the answer, they won't learn because they're trying not to learn and you've made it too easy for them. You have to make it harder for them so they have to do something so that they actually learn. Peekoff, on the other hand, is dealing with people who are there on a voluntary basis. This is a like objectivist course that's for objectivists. It's outside of the regular school system. It's like an extracurricular activity. So there's the only people there are people who actually wanted to go for some reason rather than regular school or people are like pressured into it somewhat. Like I guess you could pressure your friend into going to an objectivist course, but it's it's pretty uncommon. Like it's basically people who actually want to be there. They ought to be treated differently. Also the way the way the people at school are treated is like extra bad because they're pressured to be there and then on top of that they're pressured during class. Because the whole point is through multiple methods to pressure them to do certain things and learn certain things and be able to repeat certain words and so on. Ecoff is trying to mix things. Like, on the one hand, it is a lecture. It is not learner-led. It is not people trying to study grammar themselves and then ask Peekoff a question when they have a question. But on the other hand, uh, Peekoff doesn't want it to just be a lecture where he gives them info as if he was like a video. Which, by the way, I think a lot of lectures should be replaced with videos because you got like the best lecture and you put effort into it instead of a many many people in different places repeating the same stuff at different times with a lot of variability of quality and just content anyway Peacock is trying to make it sort of a mix between the the learners doing something and the lecturer doing something but it's very fake it's essentially just a lecture they get like the the barest little act of participation there's some real participation when they go over the homework assignments. Um, there's more of a back and forth there, where people are actually asking questions and expressing their ideas and whatever. But in, in this part, which is like a le lecture segment, it's just the most superficial trying to get them to say a few words out loud to try to make it seem more interactive, when it's not really much of an interaction. Uh, streams are very similar to a lecture, except that, yeah, it's much easier to ask a question in text than voice because voice only one person can be talking at once, but with a stream, everyone can be writing shit in text at the same time while the streamer is talking and it doesn't ever interrupt him, so it's really nice. Um, you could absolutely have the same thing in a classroom, people just don't do it, but you could have a Discord chat for your classroom or whatever, and everyone in the class joins the Discord chat, and then they can all type to each other while the lecture is going on, and the lecturer can stop and look at it periodically. You, know, you could do that. People just don't like technology or whatever. Or, I don't know. They're not very innovative in our school system. What the fuck? Well, that was buggy. All right, whatever. 
Just get the link again. It works better in Ulysses if you got the title before the link, but I tend to do it the opposite way. Okay. I'll give you guys this link. Oh, percent percent is a comment and 94 is the newsletter number. I don't want the text of the newsletter to contain the number, but I want it for my own notes, so I keep track of them. Also, after I send it, I write sent and then the date on it. So I know when each one got sent, and that way I can compare one was, and I, I mostly just look at when the previous one was sent, so I know when to send a new one. My previous one was sent on August 10th, so I can send a new one in a few days. I usually send them after around 10 to 15 days. Uh, if you're not signed up for my newsletter, by the way, you just go to Fallible Ideas and click Newsletter at the top, and you get an email every like week or two. All right, I was gonna look at this. I don't know what it is, but let's see. Спасибо Бог за лунный свет, за дивный мир других планет, за каждый миг, который проживу я. Why? Watch this with lyrics, and you'll understand. No, I won't. All right, done with that. That was an Owen Benjamin tweet. I followed him on Twitter for like two days, and I found that his Twitter is super spammy. So I unfollowed him. Also, like, the majority of it is dumb. Serious about weaving, I want to give you a comprehensive start in the fight against bad ideas that have come to dominate Western politics and culture. So, are you ready? Do you know any other stats? I'm very Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's begin. Over my years of study, I have come to view that to get anywhere, we need to see the world as it is and not as it might be. Broadly speaking, the three key thinkers of history in this regard are Charles Darwin, Nicola Machiavelli, and Adam Smith. To make Hill truly, you need to have a Darwinian view of human nature, a Machiavellian view of politics, and a view of economics in the free market tradition of Adam Smith. All three of these views analyze things as they are, not as they ought to be. They also have one thing in common a completely clear and cold eyed view of human nature itself. This common characteristic makes them fundamentally compatible as thinkers. I see many crossover points between the three of them. However, if you are starting out, it is perhaps not the completely clear and cold eyed view a view of politics and a view of economics in the free market tradition of Adam Smith. All three of these views analyze things as they are, not as they ought to be. They also have one thing in common, a completely clear and cold eyed view of human nature itself. This common characteristic makes them fundamentally compatible as thinkers. I see many crossover points between the three of them. However, if you're starting out, it is perhaps not the best or the easiest thing to start with Darwin, Machiavelli, or Smith directly. It is perhaps easier to look at their modern interpreters. For Darwin, an excellent starting point is Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate. This book is a demolition job on what is essentially is he going to give, like, actual arguments, or is it just recommendations? Because I don't agree with him, but he hasn't said why he thinks this stuff is good in any sort of detail that you could refute. 
the basis of virtually all modern leftist beliefs, namely that human beings are black slaves with no intrinsic characteristics. Pengar does not leave any stone unturned, references literally hundreds of articles with hard empirical data. No one with a shred of honesty in their body agrees that Buck can still be a social construction creationist afterwards. No one's your red bill. Okay, so he just says people who disagree with him are dishonest, and also they're leftists, despite the fact that Ayn Rand is one of the most popular people uh, who, like, wrote about ideas, more popular than Pinker, and she is a right-wing blank slate advocate. Does he not know that? Why is he ignoring that? What the fuck? Hold on, Darwin. It should be easier to transition to understand economics. One book that can help immensely with that transition is Matt Ridley's The Evolution of Everything, which makes the link between Darwin and Adam Smith explicit in their bottom-up incremental evolutionary view of the world, as opposed to a top-down centrally planned view of relentless in its cold analysis of human political action. If you're a doctor, undoubtedly, should be Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. This stresses the massive importance of considering the long-run effects, and it importantly shows... This is just way too superficial. I'm bored. I'm going to put this in reader view, so I'm going to Safari. Okay. Oh yeah, I saw this. This is kind of a big deal. Facebook came to the offices of the Obama campaign and said, we knew what you were doing. Normally we wouldn't let someone uh, grab so much of our data, but because we're on your side in the election, we let you do it. This is so fucked up. This is 2008, right? Or is it 2012? Oh, no, it's Okay. Right, and the Democrats got the data and then Facebook shut it off before Republicans got it to try to create a permanent unfairness. So a Democrat who acknowledges that this shit's unfair. And it had to be unfair because Facebook was politically biased on purpose. Like if the Republicans had made the app first, Facebook would have uh, shut it down before the Republicans got the data. No comment from Facebook.
uh, same article, or same some of the same tweets are in this article. That's why I saw it before. Pretty sure. I don't think I put this in my newsletter before, but I'm not positive. I'm going to check. Actually, I have over half an hour left, but I'm going to go P and BRB. Oh man, a cookie maker that doesn't deal with chocolate chips and raisins? Yeah, I am I've now changed my opinion to don't get it.
name is Don Dex. I'm a talk radio show host, and I love this state and country. And I'm doing everything I can to help save them. In the second week of May, the California State Board of Education enacted a controversial framework that will have a major impact on state's public education. A controversial curriculum that mandates comprehensive sex education and teaching on gender theory. The No Holds Barred K-12 Health Curriculum teaches children as young as kindergarten about gender identity issues and talks explicitly with high school students about every imaginable sector. My name is Tim Thompson. I'm the senior pastor of 412 Church in Marietta. Marietta is a small town in Southern California, but even though we're in California, we still share a lot of the same values that no America does. This is a small town feel. Uh, it's a family environment. Many people are churchgoers, conservatives. It's a horse community. It's got the wine country out here. It's just a beautiful place to live. When we first started digging into this, we thought, man, this, this is right here. This is local. Then we found it was countywide. Then we found it was statewide. And here's what we know: this is a national emergency. This is not just here in California. This is all over the nation. Let me be clear: this is not anti-LGBT. This is pro-parental rights. That's what this is all about. Many gays, many lesbians, and we don't want this stuff being taught to children. It doesn't just affect Christians here in California or America. This affects you if you're a Muslim. It affects you if you're a same-sex couple. This affects every parent. We don't want our children exposed to some of these things that are shown. It's graphic, sexually explicit material, and it has no place in the classroom. It's not right, and it won't be tolerated. My name is Eddie Hedren. I'm an attorney at Tyler and Birch LLP in Marietta, California, and we have a nonprofit as well, Advocate for Gays and Freedom, where we represent clients on issues of parental rights and religious liberty. I started hearing some buzz um, with parents and some pastors about what's going on. Vimeo needs a medium-sized player. Like, I want it to be bigger than this, but not full screen. YouTube is decent at that. Vimeo, this sucks. This is small. And it's not even gonna get bigger if I make the window bigger. It's just like this size or full screen, that's it. I think? Yeah. What is a criticism? A criticism is an explanation of why something is mistaken, why it's wrong, why it's flawed, why it will not solve the problem that it's intended to solve. On, in our school, the sex ed in our office, we had several parents call telling us about their kids are being taught. We started to investigate and try to uncover what's going on. I got together with a guy named John Andrews, he goes to my church, and I gave him some very specific parameters. I said, I want you to look at issues of life, I want you to look at issues of marriage, issues of sexuality, issues that have an impact on the culture for the Lord. My name is John Andrews, I'm a husband, a father, and a member of 12 Church in Marietta. I was reading stories in the news of controversial sex ed programs being introduced to kids, specifically in California, and uh, I, like any other concerned parent, decided to pick up the phone and sort of ask questions as to what was going on in my school district. I was able to get in touch with the right people, like I spoke with the director of curriculum, I had questions regarding a couple different controversial topics that we're hearing about a lot, but they explained to me that they were just meeting the requirements of the law to teach on gender identity or transgenderism, or whatever it is, and that's required of them, of them, 8329. But things went south, when we got a copy of Positive Prevention Plus, Sex Ed Curriculum, the curriculum that they were teaching to our junior high. The volume from this video is changing significantly. I was watching the levels. High school kids? Yeah, that's one thing. Too. And when we saw the illustrations and some of the support material that's provided from Positive Dimension Plus, some of the websites and the books that they recommend to support what's being taught to our kids, it's pornographic. They talk about anal and oral sex as an alternative to regular sex because you can't get pregnant. They talk about mutual masturbation, they discuss gender roles, the gender spectrum, and in the support material, which is provided to teachers and students um, to accompany the curriculum, they take it even further. They discuss everything, topics like role playing for different genders, blood play, dental dams, I don't even know what dental dams is. I had to look that up. Uh, fisting is mentioned. I mean, they mentioned it all. It absolutely has no place in a sex ed program for kids. If I were to show that material to a child, I'd be brought up with charges. But somehow, our public schools are allowed to teach this to junior high, high school kids. I couldn't believe sex ed looked like this. Well, John started calling the local school districts and he found out one of the districts was getting ready to release a sex ed curriculum to the parents. During this dialogue, they mentioned that there was a bet coming up and I should probably attend. It was the rollout of the sex ed curriculum program. A sex ed rollout uh, is really when a district presents the curriculum to the parents. It's sort of an introduction as to what's going to be taught to your children. And at the end, there was a brief QA. Roughly 20 parents show up to a meeting like this. And so I set out to change those odds. And I called all pastors in the valley that I knew, and I said, we need to get our congregations out to hear what is going to be taught to our children as it pertains to sexuality. When we showed up, we started to flood in. And it really overwhelmed them because they started pulling chairs out from all over the place trying to accommodate the, the sheer numbers of people that were showing up. We wanted to ensure that this pornographic, sexually explicit material wasn't going to be taught to our children. So what we did is we got together with a law firm, Advocates for Faith and Freedom. We prepared a policy that we could give to the school board in Marietta to ensure that advanced notice would be given to parents and our parental rights to pull our kids out that we didn't feel this stuff was appropriate would still be ensured. I'm Robert Tyler. I am a managing partner at Tyler Birch, a law firm, and also president of Advocates Faith and Freedom, a nonprofit, a public interest law firm that uh, serves protect our religious liberties and human rights. We work with allied organizations in order to uh, come up with a policy that we think school boards should be copied, a policy that would uh, protect parental rights and also to pr protect kids. Frankly, the oversexualization of kids today is, I think, the greatest threat to our society. Our kids are being taught about uh, every variation of sexuality, a lot of objectionable content that most parents would say, too young, too soon. The ACLU, Planned Parenthood, many radical organizations out there, our state legislature, they object to parents being notified and having the right to opt out of a lot of this content. What we proposed to the Marietta School Board was a policy that was a two-part policy. Number one is it would ensure that this material would not be taught below seventh grade. The other thing that it would do was give advance notice for any of this material that would be taught outside the context of sex ed. What this policy is about is securing our local family values. It's about us as a community coming together and saying, listen, Sacramento, listen, California Board of Education, you don't get the right to determine what's best for our community. That's what we're for. So we presented this policy to the school board, and really, we received a lot of pushback from them. Really, what we were hoping was a partnership. We were hoping they would join us to secure the rights of the parents in our community and tell Sacramento we're not good with this stuff in the area. We got a flyer about 8329 that was produced by a friend of mine, Jim Doman, Church United. And there was an action item on there to text a certain number, and then we get a response and it would tell you how your legislator voted on this issue. It was right before the election in 2018 where we had a voters forum at my church, and during that voters forum, a member of the Marietta School Board, Chris Samasian, showed up, and she stood up in the middle of our event and interrupted what was going on. She proceeded to tell my entire congregation that what we were saying was incorrect, that these policies that we were talking about had already been put in place, and we asked her where is the policy, what policy number, but she couldn't answer us. So then I of Advocates for Faith and Freedom, she ended up doing additional research and found out that in fact this policy did not exist, and everything that Chris Samasian had said to my congregation wasn't true. What brought a bunch of people with me we went to the Marietta School Board meeting, and I called her out on it. I said, you know, you said a lot of things at my church, we found out that they weren't true, and I don't appreciate you misleading my congregation. After going to the Marietta School Board, I was met with a fire storm. I had little teachers that were very upset with me, little teachers telling me that they had homosexual kids in their class and they think that this stuff should be taught. I found out later on that lady was a kindergarten teacher. I'm just 
is what kind of conversations is she having with five year olds where she thinks she's determined their sexual preference? I even had one on one meeting with Ken Dixon, who's a school board member in Marietta, who assured me that they don't want this stuff to be taught. What we were told in that meeting was, we are not teaching this curriculum, we agree with you. Uh, it's a gross curriculum, should never be taught. And assured me that as this stuff comes to a vote, these policies were put to vote that they would make sure they voted to ensure the parental advance notice and to ensure the parental right to opt out. All said and done, after the elections, they come to us with their approved policy. Nothing we asked for was in it. In fact, the entire Marietta school board unanimously voted against our policy. They had the opportunity to secure our rights as parents and they failed. Chris Demosian even ran as the pro parental rights candidate and said that if anybody was going to secure the rights of parents, it would be her. These are people we elected and trusted to ensure our parental rights, and what did they do? They ran the other way. This journey started when 76 Democrats and one Republican voted for Assembly Bill 329, which was signed into law by Jerry Brown on October 1st, 2015. It was opposed by 32 Republican lawmakers. Planned Parenthood and the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, was responsible for creating the sex education framework based on AB 329. The bill requires school districts to ensure that all pupils receive comprehensive sex health education. Parents started feeling offended by content that literally promotes sex language that encourages children to challenge their parents on sexual conduct topics. Well, during the voter forum that we did at my church, I had another pastor come up to me and say, Hey, Tim, I love what you did. Would you please come to my church and do it there? This particular church was in Reno Valley here in Southern California. I wanted to speak intelligently about this subject because I called the Reno Valley Unified School District to find out what exactly are you using, what curriculums you have to teach the children sex ed. We had an inside source who let us know that there were these somewhat secretive but technically public meetings happening at the county level involving our local school district in Riverside County. What I found out when called the Reno Valley Unified School District is they did not have a curriculum they were using yet. But what we were told is there was going to be a meeting coming up where they were going to select the curriculum. So as a result of the legislation passed here in California, 8329, this comprehensive sexuality education, what we have in California is a handful of curriculums that are approved by the state that can be used. And essentially, any district in the state can select one of these state approved curriculums or they can spend an absorbent amount of money and create their own. Uh, typically, what districts do is they select one of these pre approved curriculums. Now, what we wanted to determine for some of our local communities is what is it that's going to be chosen for those specific districts. Well, we ended up at a meeting in Riverside County at the Riverside County Board of Education, and what we thought we were walking into was a meeting where they were going to select curriculum for the city of Marine Valley. That's not what we walked into. We were in a meeting held by the Riverside County Board of Education where they were funding a company called Cardia Services to train all the districts countywide how to cut the parents out. Well, I was not able to show up for this event, and so a lady from a church in Marine Valley. So my takeaway so far is people in local politics lie heavily. And he's annoyed with how much they lie in order to push a sexual agenda on young children in school, which is supposed to be like a neutral ground for everyone rather than a politically partisan place. These are tax-funded schools. They're supposed to be, like, neutral. And the, the people in charge are lying and have an agenda. And the agenda is offensive to traditional American values. Ali decided she was able to go to this meeting. When she got there, it became very clear that we had thrown her into the lion's den without realizing it. Two men began to teach this class, and this is how they, they began. They said, we have to teach these things to the children. We have to teach them about gender inclusivity. We have to teach them about trans and non-binary gender identities. We have to teach them these things. And parents are starting to realize that they can pop their kids out of some of this stuff. What we found out was this was not for Marino Valley. In fact, this was a Riverside County Board of Education meeting where they had brought people from districts all over the county together to train the districts on how to cut the parents out. As the meeting progressed, one of the people in the meetings raised their hand and said, hey, we've got a question. We're really starting to see some opposition on this stuff, so we have to find a way around it. One of the challenges we're facing is parents don't want us to teach our kids about making room for trans and non-binary gender identities. They said, oh, so you've got parents that are coming against you? They said, no, it's not parents. It's a bunch of religious people. And the question was asked, what district are you with? Lo and behold, they were with Marietta Valley Unified School District. So they, they don't respect Christianity. They don't respect parental choice. They want to decide what children should learn. They want to indoctrinate SJWs. And yeah, the ACLU is awful. These two men proceeded to talk to everyone about how to deliberately cut parents out. They said one of the challenges we're facing is parents don't want us to teach their children about resisting the assumptions of gender identity. After a while, what became clear was these two men who were teaching the class were in fact women who identified as men, working for a company called Cardia Services. Cardia Services is a for-profit organization that trains on sex ed, and they're a biased corporation. Um, they promote an, a clear agenda and are trying to bring that to our local school. The only way for us to find out truly what was happening was to put in a legal demand for the public records. We did a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, to get all the documents showing everything that went on at this meeting. We ended up with a stack of documents eight inches thick that we had to go through, and what we found in this will blow your mind. We wanted to uncover the facts. Our records revealed that the Riverside County Department of Education spent tens of thousands of taxpayer dollars um, hiring Cardia Services. Your tax dollars funding this company to train school districts how to cut you, the parent, out. One of the things that we asked for in our public records request was the PowerPoint presentations that were being presented to our local district officials. What these PowerPoints revealed was unconscionable. It showed a clear agenda to indoctrinate our children. One of the first slides stated the registered participants of this particular October 2018 meeting, and it listed all of our local school districts. It also listed the ACLU of Southern California, Planned Parenthood, Rainbow Pride Youth Alliance, Transgender Community Coalition, and the Transgender Health and Wellness Center. Throughout the presentation, Planned Parenthood is mentioned several times. At least 10 times I came across PowerPoint slides that stated Planned Parenthood was a community partner. It gave contact information for specific Planned Parenthood individuals, and those Planned Parenthood representatives were at these meetings. Why was Planned Parenthood involved in these presentations? The answer is because they were training our district personnel that students at any age can leave school without parental consent to go get an abortion. They are training our teachers that students are allowed to do this behind their parents' back. They are specifically giving instruction on how to cover this up, and they were training these teachers to mark these kids as an excused absence and basically turn off the notification to parents that their kid was absent from school. They are doing everything they can to make sure that the parents don't find out. From a legal perspective, one of the most disturbing things I discovered with these PowerPoint slides was that the ACLU, along with Cardia Services, is training our local districts that parents may not opt out of LGBT content that they may find offensive or might want to teach their children. Yeah, so they're telling the teachers this is how it is, you have to do it. They're helping the teachers lie to parents so that the kids can get more abortions after they do all the sexual stuff they were told to do. It's fucked up. 
As I looked up Cardia, what we found was that Cardia was an ancient Roman goddess that was associated with hinged Roman doors. And I thought, well, what does that have to do with anything? As I dug even further, what I found was that Cardia, this ancient Roman goddess, was associated with fixing boundaries and marking out sacred spaces. In their mind, the public school system is theirs, and the parents have no place in it. They fix the boundaries, they want you out. Of course, I'm telling you all that this happened. And I know what it's like to say, okay, I heard said this happened, but I want to see this for myself. So here's what we did. We went undercover. You're about to watch some undercover footage of a Riverside County Board of Education public meeting where they are training districts how to cut parents out. What you're going to see is unbelievable. Watch the undercover. What the hell is wrong with Vimeo? The arrow moves like one second, and then if you hold it down, all of a sudden it accelerates and does like a minute. No, it's not playing at all. I was around 20 minutes. I'll just refresh. It's unbelievable. Yeah, just about to talk about opting out today. So, um, I'm not about that, and also, um, uh, the rights of students leaving campus to absent medical uh, attention. Concerns some pregnancies, so that means everything's too. Because I don't know what we're supposed to do, that's all we need. Um, I'm going to talk about the same direction of services, the questions to help all these uh, areas of all their instructional services. Um, we've been very fortunate to, uh, partner with, uh, Care Services. They have a grant to write these kinds of networks throughout, throughout California. It's all about the code and facts, so realize there's some, uh, perspectives. Um, but it is, uh, they look pretty clear, they're not facts, they're not facts. So, if I do that, um, there's a, today I think there's a piece of law that's going to be talked about, so I'm going to be very, 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 So they're introduced as saying that they know the law, whatever this person says is clearing up the gray areas with the truth. So at any age, and they can do whatever they want at Planned Parenthood without, or at the SLU, or something without parental consent. Or no, they said doctor's office, so they're talking about Planned Parenthood. Okay, so any age, no no parents involved, pregnancy stuff, prenatal care, contraception, emergency contraception, abortion. They really want to do an end run around the parents and not let parents have any control over their children anymore. Just like a communist collectivist state that does like group group parenting and doesn't want individuals and families and stuff. Like they actually want to break up the nuclear family so everyone can be more just the uniform masses indoctrinated by the collective education system rather than by individual families, which are different. It can all be uniform with the same curriculum controlled by these people. Abortion, um, and so many, there's no parental notification. Um, 
um, I think I think really about all these other services that California has decided are so important that we're going to allow minors to be able to go to other investment services um, because they're just not necessarily going to be back with them. And you know they're very sensitive in terms of a lot of students don't want to talk to their parents or about these kind of issues. But those who can't, right, who are in these situations, or have their college wasting away, or maybe trying to be home, right, they can't that need to have that very clear for them. The sixteen year old is having sex with another sixteen year old, which we all know happens, right? Um, technically, both of those people can be prosecuted under California law because there's no legal exception. But whether you are bound to that report, those things are technical crimes, is actually being a no. So the local then the right to school. So now they're saying that some of the stuff they're advocating is criminal, but uh, people are going to do it anyways, and that's totally understandable. Crimes are just understandable. So when the California law says no parental notification for X, they're like, yeah, the law is great. We should all follow the law. When the California law says a 16-year-old cannot fuck a 16-year-old, then they just totally ignore the law as if the law is a joke that doesn't matter and try to encourage you not to report crimes. And, and I think the key thing to remember here is that when you're thinking about confidential liability, the right belongs to the younger system. So if you want parents, belongs to the school, the right lies with the younger system. The most important piece of this is that schools cannot share this information with parents or guardians. Also, the parent also needs to know that the Now they're claiming that you cannot tell the parent, not just that you don't have to, but you're not allowed to uh, keep parents up to date on what's going on. And all of this is just assertions. They're not, you know, citing actual laws. They just got a political activist to come in and make claims about what the rules are. Teacher, or they can't call home and say, so I was outcast, you know, the doctor's office proceeding X. Um, did you know about this? Yeah, yeah. Um, they imagine most of these kind of these outcasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are they considered, um, like, absent? So I think, every rule correcting them wrong, I think it's all been like excused absence, um, the same way that if parents, well, like, because once you're absent, they call, they call them Right, so I think, again, rule correcting them correct, but I think what needs to happen is the school must be all policy so that it doesn't happen. When it comes to online attacking, it's a little trickier because... So, if the school's policy is to call and report absences, then they're saying just change the policy so that you can hide these absences from parents. Um, schools and everyone else have to report uh, attendance, right? Yeah, did you say, like, medical? That's actually a violation of the student's privacy rights. If you say excused absence, you can realize that that's a violation of the law. So, that's what that research do. Some districts do things like they'll say, oh, the student was with an administrator at this time, and that administrator, you know, they won't answer further questions. It's a little trickier, though. So, they're saying schools literally lie to circumvent the law. And they're also lying to get extra funding because if you say a student's not there, you don't get funding. I think that was the issue. So you actually have to do proper reporting about this. So they just lie anyways. Which is why it's kind of more than hard to find. There are people who are right. It can't say a student was in class just every day, right? Because that's not true to the law for the reason. Um, which is why we think kind of the best option is something that is like come with this. Don't just suppose that person was off campus having a local appointment. But saying it's excused absence does not like directly violate the law, but it's still within the discretion. Saying it's an excused, but saying they're with an administrator is not an excused absence. That's a different thing, I think. That sounds like they were actually at school. It is. So this is like you need to attend with the online time tracking. So we have um, gender identity, which is a spectrum. What's really going to happen a lot here is they're just going to mark the student as being present. That's definitely going to happen when you're encouraging this, and they're saying, well, it's a hassle to try to pretend nothing happened. So they're encouraging lying. Somebody can feel they're male, man, boy, they're all the other members. And so I think the important thing to know here is that gender, um, I don't think that's a social construct, but what's easiest is that uh, gender is not a binary, right? You don't have a male, female, stuff. There are people who identify as um, non-binary, there are people who identify as gender queer, um, there are a bunch of genders. Not only are there not gender, there are gender expressions. By the way, they say things like gender queer, they don't even explain what they mean. Like, how is gender queer different from non binary? What does it actually mean? I'm gonna check. You hear about this shit all the time. And then, wait, non binary gender is literally at the gender queer. Were they just being redundant? So, queer just means not normal. Non binary is not normal. Non binary, but really, uh, biological sex is not binary either. Like, then we have a career that we have to do. Also, we have a spectrum, right? We have a lot of Gen Z, but Gen Z scale. There's like this, uh, you know, kind of straight and clear and like everything. Um, so you can move the attraction to men, but so are the genders. Um, and then emotional attraction is also separate from So this is just all to show that these, it's a kind of complex rich world of identities that we're talking about. We say that we feel. So we have um, two spirit, by gender, male female, female, male. Trans. What the fuck is two spirit? Yeah, this, this stuff is. It's ridiculous, and it's. Why can't our schools just teach like reading, writing, and arithmetic? Why do they have to indoctrinate people with one faction's views about sex. Even if I thought all this stuff was true, I still wouldn't think that you should be teaching it in school. Like, maybe in optional classes or something. But not just making everyone attend this. This is nothing like teaching kids how to read. Or like basic history or something. They just want to attack civilization from all angles. They take everything that's civilized, that's part of our culture, and they go after it. 
and they just try to look for any weakness, anything they can they can undermine. They just want to damage anything at all to do damage overall to create holes for them to attack so that they can uh, get a foot in the door on destroying our traditions so that they can then have the socialist revolution, the Marxist revolution, the environmentalist revolution. Um, that's what these things are leading towards. I'm bored of that. Where, uh, like, to be against all kinds of racism, which of course should, uh, against racism, but racism is mixing with being in favor of multiculturalism, being uh, believing that all cultures are good. And so we mix those two together, and you have conformance, massive like, social pressure all over the place. You have a situation, oh, have that one way around, this type of fact is being this big welfare state. And that is a lot of your, uh, a lot of the welfare state benefits are tied to the fact that you have a job. So you need to have a job for one in order to enjoy some of these benefits. Now, why, why do I bring that up? Because the combination of everything I mentioned is a lot of people are, were at least for, for many years, terrified of saying your opinion anywhere. Like, you know, if you said anything against multiculturalism, that was first interpreted as then you're racist, because these two things are great. And then you can sort of friends, you know, because this group mentality, this uh, tribe mentality, like, uh, oh, we, we don't know what they do, that kind of, you know, people get isolated and sort of friends. And in the worst case, depending on the situation, people are afraid of losing your job, you know, depending on what type of job you have, if you have your know, license. There are all these social pressures that, that create the economic incentives due to the state that terrorize people. And I don't, you, you know this uh, journalist uh, on YouTube, what is his name, a very famous, uh, King Poole, yeah. or, yeah, hmm? he interviewed, uh, I saw he, he was in this video, he interviewed all these tweets, including, you know, highly professional people who are like well educated, have great job. And if you ever watch those interviews, you know, because often they refuse to be on camera, <laughs> because they knew that uh, that could end their career and end all their friendships uh, with people. And he even said that, like, often I felt like this is a very oppressed society, even though, of course, there's no censorship in that sense. Uh, actually, that's not very mentioning also. But uh, the result is uh, the combination of everything is very good, correct, even though recently people have started to wake up a little bit and people dare to criticize uh, multiculturalism, even though they don't necessarily correct at all. Uh, the only thing I want to add uh, about, uh, like, the fact that people are afraid of speaking up and saying what they think uh, is that uh, Sweden, like many European countries, uh, we have these so called. Uh, I guess you could roughly translate it into hate speech at all. Mm -hmm. And they really, they are not the censorship. And they're applied completely arbitrary. Uh, so depending on how lucky you are, uh, all kinds of statements can be, uh, you know, claimed by government to be uh, examples of inciting violence or inciting for threats against uh, various groups. And uh, then you can be fine with the depending on the situation. And because the laws are so non objective, uh, you know, a lot of people don't dare to take risks. So a lot of people shut up. Uh, I can give you one super perverse example of this. Uh, some years ago, there was a, a guy complaining on social media that uh, the, the mosque, nearby mosque, was uh, playing all these. Uh, Prayer calls, calls prayer, you know, through speakers really loud. And he complained and said, like, oh, it sounds like a donkey screaming. Like, he was just upset. Okay. So, this happened next. The people in the mosque found out what was being said about this uh, their prayer, call prayer. And they started to uh, surround his home and, like, in a threatening manner. Like, and uh, this guy was afraid that he was getting, you know, going to get beat up or something. He was really afraid. Police called in. Then the police called in the police all the time and they figured out what happened, what was going on. This guy was uh, now, like, uh, you know, dragged to court because of his comments, not the people threatening him, acting in a threatening manner. So, and that was obviously called racist reason, you know, inciting anything against anyone with that comment. Uh, there are many examples like this, and I can go on about it. So there are a lot of things that, uh, that go back to the original question, like, are these very multicultural and political? Yes, but a lot of them are also hard to know all the time because a lot of people don't always say what they think because they're afraid of the social pressures and the, you know, the laws and stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the impression I get of the Swedish and a lot of these, um, like, nanny states is that the government treats everybody like children. Um, so, like, you know, some of us, maybe some of us more than others who maybe have big mouth growing up, would get in trouble as a child, maybe even more than people being violent. So here we've got a group of people threatening somebody, but the guy who said the forbidden word or, or, was, or was politically threatened is the one being arrested. Um, yeah, that's the impression I get of, uh, of the Scandinavian countries. Um, you, so you grew up in, in Sweden, in the city, in Stockholm? I know you guys have one city, is that true? Stockholm, that's the one? Uh, well, I didn't grow up in the one city. No. Uh, we have a few more. Uh, I grew up in uh, South Sweden, uh, in a city called uh, Helsingborg. Uh, it's uh, very near Denmark, about a 20 minute boat ride, and then we're in Helsingborg, and uh, yeah, and I, I lived in Sweden for almost the first 30 years of my life. And then I moved to Finland, and then I moved to America, and then I moved back to Finland where I currently live. So mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I'm a bit of a man of the world. That's right, you're, you're a global renaissance man. So with, was your education, what they, what, like public school education, did you go to a public funded school growing up? Oh, yeah, like overwhelming majority. Uh, mm -hmm. did, Mostly, yeah. So in, in America, our public schools make people. Technically retarded. I, I mean, it's, it's incredible to me the level of stupidity. And what I mean is, people they cannot uh, relate one topic to another. Like to them, it's like the, the topic of economics has nothing to do with with um, you know, with cooking. And cooking has nothing to do with um, with math. And math has nothing. Just the different subjects are just each one is in a vacuum. Everything's compartmentalized, and it's very difficult um when when uh, people when they grow up and they need to be an adult, they need to uh, be coherent. What's the education like in Sweden? Is it kind of like that, or or is it a little bit more um integrated? I wouldn't say it's uh, very integrated. Uh, as far as I know, now hell, you know, there can be degrees in hell, of course. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, ever since at least the 90s, Sweden uh, adopted what you could maybe call uh, you know, progressive education, which is uh, the education philosophy that has dominated the US for decades. Uh, like, 50, 60, 70 years at least. Uh, going all the way back to the 40s, 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 John Dewey, and uh, his, uh, his uh, best student. Now. But anyway, uh, so Swedish education it has, suffers from a lot of the same problems that America has, but it might be just to a lesser degree because uh, you know, it takes decades to change the educational philosophy in, in a bad direction, just overnight. But it's just so funny. I used to spend uh, some years in America studying the history of American education, all kinds of important uh, pedagogical approaches, the uh, educational philosophies. And what I was shocked over the when I was like, reading about all this was that I remember and recognized a lot of this from my own, own years in school. So I was like, oh no, uh, it's, it's just that's how easy easily get a sense of how that is in America when I go to school there, but I recognize so much of it. All this enormous focus on group work, group projects, uh, this indifference to facts, uh, to thinking skills, 
uh, for example, and they general uh, hostility to the hierarchical nature of market hostility to the hierarchical nature of market hostility to the 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 market also around the same time that Sweden began lessening the socialist policies, is that right? Is the 90s? So people say, they say, whenever you tell people socialism doesn't work, they say, but what about Sweden? And you say, yeah, what about it? So if I understand, and I've heard you speak about this in the past, uh, Sweden was one of the most, uh, one of the biggest capitalist success stories in the 19th century and maybe up until the 1960s, you're very much uh, leaning towards the free market side, and then around the 60s began experimenting with socialism. Am I, am I basically correct? Uh, that's close enough, I would say. Uh, the, uh, it's close enough. It's close enough. Uh, yeah, Sweden is uh, definitely not uh, an example of how you know, socialism works or anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, one have different definitions of socialism, but uh, the way I, I understand, and I think most people understand, is that socialism is a system in which the government owns and controls the economy. Okay? Mm -hmm. We have to be very specific here. But what I mean by owns and controls the economy? Because a lot of people might think, well, there are some controls, so I guess the government is in control. But that, there's a big difference still between the controls you have in a mixed economy and the controls you have that I'm talking about. I'm talking about total control. That's socialism. Mm -hmm. So, and it's basically the difference between this. It's the difference between you running a business in, say, America today, and you're running into some stupid regulation that stops you from doing something. Okay? That's, that's evil and bad. Versus, you sit and wait for orders to come in from the government telling you what to do, how to produce, what to produce, when to produce. That's a day and night difference. And so, for that reason, you can't confuse a country like Sweden and believe socialism just because it has a lot of economic control, just like the US. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, and if you then think about it, that uh, it's not also just Sweden, by the way, that uh, you know, uh, we're way more free economically in the 19th century. Every Western, every Western country, with you know, Japan as a possible exception, uh, became really rich in the late 19th century, early 20th century, before uh, everything today associated with the existed. Uh, before a lot of these regulations were existed. And I actually argue that if they had even tried for a moment to implement the big welfare states, a lot of these economic controls, all the high taxes, all the redistribution, in the 19th century, we would never become rich in the first place. We would completely undermine everything. Mm -hmm. So, I often think of uh, Sweden as ironically, uh, yet one more example of uh, you know, showing that capitalism is still so the the argument people make is they call it socialism. But I think the point they're trying to make is they say, okay, forget about communism and like hard socialism. They're yeah, it's really important that these countries they got a lot of wealth doing one thing, and then they started doing the welfare state, and that's not how they got rich, and it's not a way of creating wealth, and it's it's preventing their progress. They sort of decided everything's good enough, and now they're not making much additional progress. They really slowed down uh making things even better which is bad and it's getting in the way of colonizing space and conquering aging and other major projects that so we should be going full steam ahead you know we're not done yet with progress we have so much to do but they're just sort of oh what we have is really nice let's try to have that for everyone uh, by taking from the entrepreneurs the innovators so that they can't make as much progress so that we can catch up the other people who are not doing much. Ooh, chickity check one. YouTube killed the video. Yeah, fucking rip. See, this is why I was interested in watching a little bit of Owen Benjamin, as YouTube hates him like that much. There's something, there's one thing available. Well, hello there, everybody. Played it out there. Everyone have 13 children in case one day two. That's funny because. He's right about some of the stuff he says, like that Crowder is a uh, controlled opposition and stuff. Uh, like that certain people who are too mainstream and too popular are not going to say some things. Uh, like that's a reasonable point whereas he is um you know so hated and reviled and whatever uh, he can say all kinds of shit there, there's some advantages to that i can't find a woman who has morals anywhere show her man leads woman show her women aren't as inherently moral as men okay they're, they're more formidable i'm the guy i'm a guy who's sexy yeah. that's, that's true you can call me whatever name you want check out my video guys it's not the first time i've been called crazy since i was a kid why are you some of the examples um i don't know i was, right some examples I was crazy for um not going to graduate school when i became a comedian uh a lot of people said i was quote unquote crazy and quote unquote throwing my life away after I became more financially successful, I would make more in a month than they would make in a year, even though I didn't care about that. But it's just, they were saying that I was going to end up uh, like a homeless person. Or, you know, I'm your crazy. I was all crazy for questioning the food pyramid when I was in elementary school. When I was in elementary school, I said, my mom said that we've grown bread, it should not be the main thing that we eat. And they said, you are a crazy, literally a crazy boy. I'm used to it. It doesn't mean anything. When someone calls you crazy, it means they're either dumb or they've under. He's not in a position to speak freely. Uh, he has to suck up to and pander to certain people, or he would lose his position. Whereas, like, Owen is already on the outside. So I think what I remember Owen talking about in some video was he was doubtful that Crowder and certain other people would call out the uh, the murder of Jeffrey Epstein, and that they he thought that they would buy the official story because they don't want to get 
ousted from mainstream discourse to the extent that they're in it. Because doubting the official story about Jeffrey Epstein's death in prison isn't going to get you called a conspiracy theorist by a lot of people. And so Crowder, uh, he thinks, goes out of his way to avoid that kind of thing, whereas he himself is already called a conspiracy theorist, so he can say that. Now, I have not been following Crowder lately. I just have a sort of general impression of him, and that seems reasonable to me. Sell out, they can't comprehend the truth. Like, for example, and I will amend things that, that I don't care if I'm right, but I'm trying to be right. And if I'm not right, I'll amend. Like, for example, yesterday, the uh, Epstein Island thing with the little kids' girls from Japanese, my guys did a thorough research on that, and we couldn't fully verify the source, overbearing my trust, and um, Captain Color. By the way, things are getting, you know, we've become so big here that I don't really let in a ton in my circle these days. But overbearing trust, um, Captain Color trust, so I took down the post because I, I no longer can verify. I, I know it's real. I'd say it's 50% real. But after people I trust came to me and said, we can't verify this, I said, okay, so I took it down because I don't have an agenda outside of what is true. That, that happens all the time. Yeah, that would all the US media. Not necessarily. There's all kinds of shit. Like, okay, for example, a German politician was, was shot by uh, someone who disagreed with their open politics and it never reached American media. That's a massive story. You know, that shit happens all the time. Reading other countries' media is very important to understand other perspectives. Because when the American media has a vested interest in something, they will not report on it. Okay? That being said, if your guys find out like they can't verify it, then I retract. And I don't page 12 my retraction. I just say, Billy Shooting has gone quiet too. Yeah, because it was real. Uh, Overdress says, I'll put holes in our armor. Yes. When you go truth, you can't be. There's no Achilles heel. You just, okay. I saw that. I read it. I got it from uh, Base Taxon Bear, who's a valid guy. Base Taxon is a true seeker, true power. Fully trust him. Still, he wasn't, he wasn't spreading false information for an agenda. Of course not. One of the reasons the bears are so effective is because we trust each other. Until you don't, until someone's like, I was a pair. Until Owen deleted me just for saying that I'm going to rape his family. So uh, then all the bears work on it, and we can't verify it, so then we, I just, I'll take 10 minutes explaining this. It's not like, there's no shame in this. There's no shame. American media should be replaced with another turn of the enemy. They are. So there, there's clearly child sacrifice happening. I can't verify that that is currently that they found child skulls on Epstein Island. That's it. Um, there was big blood. Yes, people died with plants. Like, what's the fault? Things survive 90 degrees. You can forget, I don't do this, obviously. You can forget the water for a couple days, and they'll just be like, eh, just crushing, laying like every day. Like goats, they don't need a bed. They just stand there. Eh. There's milk all day. They'll, they'll, they eat, they need, like, they have like lactose intolerance. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you right now. It's like you don't need zero degrees. You're like, uh, 100 degrees. You're like, uh, human beings are dead in all those environments. So the materialists who say that we are nothing but random snatching of genitals and we're ideal for our environment, you know, that's why we have an eyebrow. I listened to, um, was it one of these material, one of these atheists, who, by the way, was Epstein Island, they just revealed his name. What's his name? Uh, the, the biggest atheist. What's his name? One of the four horsemen of the Black Brigade. Um, I can't remember his name. But it's like, you know, when a sweat would fall in the ancient hundreds, and if they didn't have a big enough eyebrow, it would like, for one moment, they wouldn't be able to see the tear. And so the one with the bigger eyebrow, you know, had more baby Dawkins. Yeah, Dawkins was a pedo island guy. That's now cemented fact. So that one had more baby. Okay, how about that? We burn in the sun and freeze in the cold. We're slow and weak. No, well, I mean, this is, no, we're not supposed to be here. This is obviously a test, and you fight, fight, fight until the good Lord takes you home. Because animals are faster than us, they're stronger than us. Oh, the only thing they don't have is a soul. And I know people get furious at me. I have an animal over myself. I injected 45 chickens yesterday with antibiotics. I did one uh, a stint for her leg. I have four dogs. I have goats. I love, I love my animals. I protect them day in and day out. As you whack off your mommy's basement, you watch one every block of the video and you think they're They don't have souls. We do. They have everything else. Animals are more equipped for this world than we are. We're slow. We're weak. The strongest of men is, is weaker than a chimpanzee. The fastest of men is, is weaker than my, one of my alpacas. It doesn't need a root or. Oh, that's so misleading. I don't agree with that. Humans are not, in general, like the strongest animal or the fastest animal or whatever. But we're very flexible or we're pretty high up on a lot of different metrics. Uh, we have a lot of endurance. We're reasonably strong. We're reasonably fast. We can climb. We can swim. We can hold our breath for a little bit, enough to like harvest some oysters or something. But not like for streams, it's fine. For oceans, it's not fine. Um, so actually, as an animal, we're, we're pretty strong and powerful. And, you know, if, if we're a bad animal, we wouldn't have made it this far. Like, because we had, we had done a lot of our animal evolution before we had intelligence. And we were a viable species back then. Before we started using tools and whatever. Like, step one was just get sort of similar to us as an animal. And that, that was good enough to replicate. For a bet, and they eat grass. But we have souls, we have consciousness. God has breathed, breathed life into us, and it's a test. Watch the cult of materialism on the tube list, awesome. Yeah, it's a cult. Uh, but, 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 invented clothes and mothers, now we're useless everything. <laughs> it's all right here, you know? All right, so anyway, Stephen Crowder joined a band. You gotta give him props, I mean, he's getting up there in age, childless, obviously. But him and his best buddy joined a band. And so this is the song that they wrote. I'll do a quick cover here. Let's find that. Hello, dumpster, his rear end. Plants come with nickels once again. Because he's owned by Blaze TV. Many small hats have come to see. The pumping into Crowder, old Stevie. It's Blaze TV. Echo. Sound of shilling. And a naked Shapiro. Reminds Robert Bennett that he's a Jew. Shapiro climbs up for the Crowder train. Throwing quarters, he is making it rain. And the pumping doesn't stop till they're all done. Oh, what fun. Echo. The sound of shilling. Now Alex Jonesy takes a ride. Crowder doesn't realize he's inside. Because his planner wiener is so small it's insane. But it's pump full of alpha brain. But Alex doesn't care cause he's on DMT. Oh goodness me. Echo. The sound of shilling. A, a fool says I'm in the mall club. And Steven will come and take a rub. All his money comes from boomer dads, who don't care that all their kids are sad. And the nickels flow like silent raindrop fell. Shapiro, echo, no sound of shilling.
So, you know. Owen's like an actual performer who has worked in Hollywood and shit. Um, you know, skill wise, that was decent. I thought the lyrics were uh, very homophobic, very mean. Uh, they didn't. Ha they did not contain substantive arguments. But you can get some of the gist of the kinds of thing he thinks, like that Blaze TV is uh, controlled opposition or uh, too mainstream, not able to speak the truth, whatever. And you know he has similar opinions of Crowder, Ben Shapiro. Uh, he seemed mad at Alex Jones too. I don't know. We wrote that like uh, 10 minutes before we streaming. I was just like, hey, Bears, any, uh, we still had the original line. Here go. Let's listen to Ben Shapiro again. Okay, so I have to talk more about the truth, Ben. Hold your head up, we probably shouldn't take a job that's not hanging up. That'd be a Also, it's not true. The people in the United States are working together. It's just not true. According to the census, statistics, a small number of Americans have more than one job. Because either they need extra income or because they want to gain more experience or support different interests. There's a recently released U.S. Census Bureau report. So do you think the Amazon warehouse workers are pursuing extra interests? They can't. The reason kids are getting so fucked up is because they don't have moms at home. Because their dad and mom have to work. They're not pursuing their interests, Ben. They work jobs they hate so that they can provide for their family. Yes, I'm an active. Um, I, I tell people don't buy a lot of shit. You know, keep materialism low. But at the same time, this is total nonsense. The found is that approximately 8.3% is as of 2013. So that's actually lower now. 8.3% of workers had more than one job. That was as of 2013. It's a lot lower now. So this notion that there are just tons and tons of people who are working multiple jobs, it is not really true. It's not actually the reality. In May, 5% of Americans had multiple jobs. 5%. That's really what's bringing down the unemployment rate. That's not true, by the way. That's not true, Ben. 5% of workers have multiple jobs. How about how many homes have to have the woman working? What's that? 80%? That's multiple jobs. The woman shouldn't be at work, Ben. And for all the talk about people working at Uber, it's, it's, it's held to that range actually really since 2009. It's always been a very, very low number. So this again is just a lot. Yeah, I this guy. Making me very anti-Semitic. Would you guys see why I make fun of him so much? He's becoming the, like the voice, the mouthpiece of evil. And he's so vampiric. How does anybody watch that and say, oh, that guy's got charisma, I want him in the media? You can see how Ben Shapiro is defending the status quo there, and Owen is saying that we have a problem in this country. And Owen doesn't like Ben because Ben is saying everything's fine. Um, he's helping the elites in power just sort of keep things stable. So that's the sort of general trends of what's going on there. It's just unbelievable. I think he's a shapeshifter, BB, like I contact. He looks, he, what, what is he? I don't know. I don't know what, what he is. You, uh, how many jobs have you had, Ben? Oh, yeah, just one. Oh, he has no jobs. And his woman is, is the doctor of the house, and his kids are being raised by immigrants. And they'll end up being just sociopathic weirdos like him, just who hate tall people, hate joyous people, don't know where their food comes from, wants to punish any group of people in the world with any logos. Shapiro's so out of touch. Yeah, he's a retard. Oh, and he's looking so, he's a golem. Yeah, he's a total golem. And he brags about being in the, I'm in the top one. Actually, um, uh, what do we got? God, give me one second. Uh, that guy who said that. Fuck. This is flawed stuff, but it's nice to hear something different sometimes. It's less mainstream. Like, it's good to have some familiarity with different opinions. And he's certainly not wrong about everything. I can't look at Shapiro? No, no one can. He can't look at uh, uh, mirrors. That's why they say vampires always stay away from mirrors, because they hate the, the yeah, Ben Vampiro. <laughs> His evil laugh makes me sick. Because he's full of hatred. And these, and these small ads say, and by the way, it's less than 1% of the population. So don't feel overwhelmed just because they own all the information. We still are the majority. And you can say he's not being very intellectually serious and he's being insulting and stuff. And that's true. However, uh, you know, Ben Shapiro is not very intellectually serious either. He's just dishonest about it, and he pretends that he is. Whereas Owen Benjamin is not pretending to be smarter than he is. He's not pretending that his arguments are more logical than they are. Um, so I appreciate that, that the, the argument quality matches the tone and style and presentation instead of him being a fraud like Shapiro and Peterson and Harris and so on, who are not nearly the intellectuals that they claim they are. It's more watchable when someone's openly not super serious, because there aren't enough serious things to watch. There aren't enough things that are actually really good. So I have a choice of things that are kind of bad, but they're lying about how serious they are, or stuff like this that just isn't even pretending. So some of this is nice. There's certainly downsides. I don't watch this like a lot, but the advantage of conservatives is a wizard. Oh, I know, but the conservatives are—it's their weakened anuses that, and their appetites that make them susceptible to it. Like the, 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 I'll, show you, I'll show you the quote-unquote conservatives. Would you like to see conservatives? Here's two conservatives. We have Stephen and Gitnickel. Um, they conserve nothing. They couldn't conserve the female bathroom. Stephen Crowder right now is ranting about how paper straws are fake. Shapiro is in touch with himself. He's disgusting. You got an email so I can send some stuff on. I don't know what you guys are talking about. He's slowly speech so he can get Tucker's job. It's just—I mean. That'll be the last nail in the American media. 
if, if Dr. Carlson gets replaced by Ben Shapiro, because that's the thing, that's why these people don't like killing people or doing these big moves, because it, 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 like when the Clintons first started killing people, some of their first murders were uh, a couple of kids that found out about their, um, their drug trafficking. They uh, laid them on tracks after murdering them. This is all true. This is not a uh, conspiracy. This has all been verified by federal prosecutors. Um, they laid them on tracks to make it look like they fell asleep on train tracks and were run over by a train. Uh, that was their first murder, I believe, that was known. They still can't get away from it. Like the, the mother of, of one of the boys recently confronted Bill Clinton. Like, you murdered my son. You know, it's, it's a huge liability to actually do one of these uh, suicides. Um, that's why I just always know I'm incapable of suicide. If, if it ever appears like I've killed myself, I didn't. Incapable. But they don't like doing that because it leaves them open. Uh, yeah, fall asleep on the train track. Right, and that's why it's so important when people say, why do you care about the moon landing? Why do you care about the moon landing? Um, because people have no ability of discerning what's true or false. So if you can't see that we didn't go to the moon, you will also believe the kids just fell asleep on a train track and was run over by a train. You also believe that Jeffrey Epstein, despite all evidence and all, um, everything, that he was just despondent and hung himself in a room without ropes or hooks or anything after he complained that people were trying to murder him. It's more likely that those kids fell asleep on the track and Jeffrey Epstein hung himself in a thing than we went to the moon. Which is why I hammered that so much, because if you let one in, you can let in anything. Like, you don't have a discernment. Moon landing is a spell. Spells are uh, blinding and binding. Exactly, Mr. Anderson. The moon landing is a spell. The Holocaust is a spell. I'm going to disagree about the moon landing. I would say that's more likely. I, I would definitely believe Jeff Jeffrey Epstein uh, killed himself before, I believe, the moon landing was a hoax. And there's, by the way, there's different versions of killing himself. Like, there's uh, people provided him with tools to kill himself, but then he actually, you know, had the choice rather than being murdered. Spell. And again, I'm not saying Jews didn't die in World War II. Of course they did. Everybody did. It was a mass murder of Satanism. But to kill 100 Jews an hour between, for seven straight years, 24 hours a day for 365 straight days, nonstop, just like with gassing and, you know, these creepy camps with the lines. And of course not. Of course not. The ma oh, so he's a Holocaust denier because 100 deaths per day is, like, implausible? Seriously? You can kill more than 100 people per day if you have, like, millions of workers doing it. Like, they had so many people to do the killing. They certainly had more than 100 people on killing duty per day. And so it's, like, one kill per, per guard per day or something? That's, like, possible, and they had... The ratio can be a lot lower than that, and it works. That is 100 Jews an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, for seven straight years. And in the most grotesque, sci-fi, horror movie way humanly possible. You also have to believe that Anne Frank wrote her diary with a pen that wasn't invented until 1949. Uh-oh! Ballpoint pens weren't used in they weren't in mass use until at least 1949. The diary of Anne Frank is partially written in a ball in a ballpoint pen that isn't um, that wasn't available to her when she quote unquote wrote the um okay Eli Wiesel who wrote Nights. And okay, I don't know anything about that one. The Anne Frank diary being fake. That's not like out of the question, you know, because it's just like a, a relatively small minor issue. Whereas with the Holocaust, um, you know, there's so many different pieces of evidence, so many people who lost relatives. Um, you can't just be like, oh, well, we, we found one little discrepancy. Like, a discrepancy can change a, mal a small thing, like whether a particular book was real, or whether a particular person was killed, or it could adjust the numbers a bit. But there's no re I don't think there's any reasonable getting away from, like, the Holocaust as a whole. And every kid was forced to read it? He's admitted it wasn't true. Okay, why do these things matter? Why don't you just, why don't you just uh, go with the flow? Why, why do you always have to make trouble? Because if you can't see through this bullshit, you will believe the Vegas shooting is totally normal. You'll believe that a few kids just laid down on a track for a nap that witnessed the, the Clinton drug cartel uh, uh, transporting drugs in the 80s in in, uh, when he was governor in Arkansas. You'll believe that 19 hijackers just hated our freedom and just used box cutters to fly jumbo jets into uh, the Pentagon and, and World Trade Center. Just because, like, you're, you're useless. And then, God forbid, uh, it's like... Yeah, how retarded do you have to be to go to sleep on the train tracks for a nap? Like, why would you nap there instead of, like, near the train tracks? Or maybe even not near the train tracks, because trains are noisy, or whatever. Yeah, you can kill a lot of people when you put enough work into it. Anyway, the, the Clinton train track thing, though, sounds ridiculous and, like, not a very good cover-up. I haven't looked into the Clinton body count very much, but I've, I've heard things about it, and I... You know, I think there's some truth to it. I don't know about every individual case, but I know some of the crimes they've done. And like, there's if you read High Crimes and Misdemeanors by Ann Coulter, there's a bunch of documentation of some of their crimes. I don't know if there are any murders talked about in that book. There might have been like one or not, maybe not. I don't know. I don't remember. But it, it, there was definitely like white collar crime with a bunch of details. Like something were to happen to me, you would be one of those people like Ben Shapiro would be like, I stand up and say that isn't true, or else they have complete power. All of, the, all of these evil people's power comes in, uh, <clears throat> Anne Frank was a pseudonym? Well, it's just, I don't, I don't, I'm not even interested in all that. I just, like, okay, the Anne Frank diary is a forgery. It was written in a pen that she couldn't have had. Ta-da! Right, so, like, I'm open to the specific book being a forgery, but just Holocaust denial in general, like, fuck you, Owen. 
Anyways, unrelated to that, I'm gonna go now. Not because I'm mad at Owen, it's just I'm I got other stuff to do. So later guys.